welcome to the second day on how the European Universities Initiative can support the European Green Deal. It's my pleasure to present the first annual open forum of the TORCH project. the opening of this brand new academic year and the opening ceremony. Bon dia a totes i a tots. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the second day of the annual CharmU uh, conference. It's a great pleasure for us to welcome you here. I hope that you yesterday enjoyed both the conference and the city at the evening. And tomorrow, today, sorry, we are going to proceed with the first panel where we will have an intervention from four uh, other um, alliances, well, actually CharmU and three other alliances that they will be talking on how can European universities contribute to the EC Digital Action Plan, to European Commission's Digital Action uh, Plan. And for that goal, we'll have uh, with us from the CharmU Alliance, um, Vanessa Vigano from University of Montpellier and Daniel Griffin from Trinity College Dublin. We will also have from the Eurotech Alliance texting an example of interoperability Ben Parker, that he will be joining us telematically. We will also have uh, Jesus Alcover from UNITE, Best Practices Example Metacampus from the UNITE Alliance. And finally, we will also have Christian Bock from the UNUS SURF towards a European digital ecosystem for education. And chairing the session, we have uh, Marga Bonmati and also uh, Jan Arus. Uh, thank you very much and enjoy this first session. Now, sorry. Good morning to all uh, and welcome to the University of Barcelona and also welcome to its wonderful historic and most representative building, uh, which celebrates just this year its 150 anniversary. Uh, the reason for this, uh, this morning session, as, as uh, Ander has, has uh, commented previously, is to is to see how can European universities, it's okay? Sorry, now? Well, now it, this session is uh, in order to see how can European universities contribute to the EC Digital Action Plan. And we have uh, with us relevant speakers uh, that will present in detail in a moment. <laughs> but uh, we will divide the session into two parts, dedicating the second one to the colloquium and questions to, to them, to our colleagues. Uh, in, the, in the first part of the session, we will have uh, short presentations from our speakers, approximately uh, 60 minutes, uh, where th they will talk about their experiences, uh, well, yes, and vision. And the invited guests uh, and the invited speakers include a representative of the European uh, University Alliance and representatives uh, of the founding partners chair EU. And Jan, uh, I think uh, we can start with the first experience, as you know perfectly, isn't it? Yes. Yes. 
Thank you very much, uh, Marga. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really happy that I'm the one who is going to, to present uh, the first speakers, uh, to introduce them. Uh, Alex Lodder, uh, he's from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, he was coordinating the virtual learning environment. He was very much involved in Work Package 4.4, the VLE, Learning Management System for Charm. Uh, he did a great job. Uh, he unfortunately is not able to be here, but Vanessa and Daniel are. Um, and Vanessa Figano, uh, she's based on uh, the University of Montpellier, worked as an educational digital educationalist in CharmU, supporting the local and international teaching staff in designing their activities aligned with our pedagogical principles. And she currently is leading the emerging technology team and hybrid classroom team among the Alliance, and she's an active member in the team in charge of the virtual learning environment too. Uh, her mission is to offer a wonderful experience to all actors involved in CharmU projects uh, uh, by supporting them with tech wow effects and by providing a problem solver attitude when needed. Vanessa studied communication sciences and have worked uh, as UX researcher, IT accessibility manager, e-service designer for public administrations in France, Italy and Switzerland. And then Daniel Graffin from Trinity College Dublin, uh, teaching fellow in emerging technology at Trinity College Dublin. Uh, and he supports students and staff in class and online. And he's part of the core team for the transdisciplinary research and social innovation modules and a repeating guest lecturer in the capstone module. Prior to teaching on CharmU, he worked with the pilot work package, work package seven, and the VLE team were in work package four and co-lead emerging technology in work package 4.5 and the hybrid classroom build teams. And then he was also a charm mentor, PhD candidate at the CD school uh, of education with a research interest in mixed realities, tools for distributed teamwork. And he has a technical background and have worked as a software engineering lecturer, IT manager and professional web developer in previous roles. So we have the really right persons on board of Charmy U. Um, now I will give over the floor to you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, and hello to everybody. Um, okay, so uh, it's a real shame that Alex wasn't able to join us because um, he's been such a foundational part to everything that we've done. But um, we're going to try and cover his material. Um, so thank you everyone for having us. And it's been a great conference so far. Maybe we'll jump straight into our slides if we could, please. We have our slides. Or else we're going to have to improvise. <laughs> Great, here we go. Slow start. I think everyone's a little tired after last night anyway, right? Turn your laptop around.
Right, technology problems with the technology team, but uh, it's a classical. It had to be. Had to, had to go that way, didn't it? Um, all right. Well, thanks for your patience, everybody. Um, uh, it's great. The audience is bigger now. So it's good. Um, okay, so let's uh, kick off. So again, thank you, everyone, and um, thanks to Alex who can't be here, and uh, we really miss him today, but uh, he's here in spirit with us. So. Um, let's dive into our presentation, so please, next slide please. Yeah, thank you, uh, which I can't read from here. Uh, could you maybe show me what we're looking at? Thank you. Oh yeah, okay, so quick, um, it's a bit redundant to introduce Charmy you to this audience, but I think there are some people who maybe don't know. Um, so we are uh, part of the technology teams, 4.4 uh, and 4.5, actually I have left them officially both of them, and I'm in the classroom these days, but Vanessa leads 4.5, which is the Emerging Technologies Group, and uh, we worked together on that. And um, we also worked in the VLE team in 4.4, and we have some members, Martha over there, and uh, I think um, that's it, it in the room. But it's a, it was a big team, and it kind of had people coming in and out of it over the course of uh, two years, really, in preparing for um, our launch and our technology stack really is, a, is the influence of all those people and it, uh, it was great working with everybody. Um, looking back, we um, have, well, our VLE that we've been, we're going to introduce you today. Um, some of you are very familiar with it, some of you probably aren't. And uh, we also want to talk a little bit about the hybrid classroom, which we think is the, the real gem of uh, the Charmy teaching approach. So uh, looking forward, then we'll have some lessons learned for you. And um, actually, Vanessa and I, together with quite a few people in this room, actually, um, Sylvia and Jake, who I can see, worked on a paper um, with Alex and Sana and Dimitra, uh, who's also here. And the recommendations from that are published now, but we'll go over some of those for you today as well. And um, yeah, that's kind of it. So we jump to our next slide, please. Thank you. And I think you're okay. kicking off. Yeah, so it's, it's me now. So I don't know if you have heard about this alliance, Charm AU. Uh, short introduction uh, for you. We are building together, actually, um, the University of the Future. So at the, at the moment, we are five. We are going to be eight uh, next year. And um, we worked together um, from our institutions um, by dividing all the job and all that huge ambitions in different work packages. So we are talking, as Daniel said, um, mainly about work package four, which was in charge of the teaching and learning uh, part uh, of the project, uh, led by Utrecht, by Jan, actually. And uh, it's nice uh, to, uh, to point out, maybe, uh, that uh, me and Daniel are not from Utrecht, but we are presenting now, so we are really working as a, as a team, um, as a new-born um, uh, university team, actually. Uh, we have uh, been asked many times, me and Daniel, from which university we, we, were, co we were coming from, uh, and so we had to uh, underline, well, I'm from Montpellier and he is from Trinity, even if uh, actually Actually, we are working so closely together. So the community uh, building part uh, is achieved, I would say, in the IT group. Uh, next slide, please. So yes, those are uh, the, the basics of the subgroups um, that built actually the, the IT uh, environment of CharmEU. 
4.4 and 4.5 teams. We can see Marta in the slides with, with her uh, Explorer suites. Marta is here today. I'm very happy to see her. <laughs> so from ELTE. Then Anthony, uh, that um, luckily went to retirement la last year and he's enjoying a new adventures. Uh, we do have uh, the pirate uh, Daniel uh, in the slide. Still no uh, explanation of why I'm the pirate, but oh, we'll yeah. figure, we'll figure that one out. I think that you look like, yeah, so uh, yeah, so why not? So we do have Alex and me. So um, I would like to insist on uh, the different perspective we, we, we had in our team um, that, was, that was possible because we came from different uh, realities, from different institutions. So this exchange is very important to have uh, a team um, that can rely on, on uh, all uh, the different experiences of our institution. Um, and uh, yes, and then also uh, we uh, were a former member of 4.4 and 4.5, but we work closely with, with other work packages. As, as um, Daniel was introduced as work package 7 member, which is uh, the, the, the pilot uh, work package on charge of the master, which is a part of the entire uh, Charme U project. Uh, yes. Please, next slide. Okay, so looking back, uh, looking back, we started in, uh, in uh, February 2020, you started because I wasn't there yet, and, uh, and then uh, we started working uh, together on what we had on our uh, plate, on our desks actually in each university. And then we started also cooperating on something more practical, pragmatical, the master, the pilot master, and that where uh, actually the game become harder and we had uh, to, to understand where we wanted to go and uh, make it real. So looking back, next slide please. Uh, step one was to set the objectives. Students will come, students will start this path. So we do need the correct environment. And to do so, we, we, we said, we agreed on, on, uh, on three uh, main parts of our environment. We wanted a virtual learning environment to connect uh, all, uh, all uh, the, the students to, to run the activities uh, and to allow um, this, this path to happen. We wanted to spice it up with emerging techno technologies. We wanted to stress a little bit on the soft skills of students by adding uh, some, some special uh, activities, uh, something out of the ordinary. And we wanted to make it physical, real, hybrid classrooms were needed. It's not an online experience, not just that. We are the geeks, but we want to make it uh, real. Uh, so, uh, so we started talking about rooms that can provide this kind of experience lively. Thank you. Um, so I'm definitely getting Thank you. Turning it on and off. Um, great. Okay. So yeah, the um, the intent really here was to talk about the kind of common ground that we had. So um, we did have obviously these requirements, and uh, these were informed by work with the KCTs, work with other work packages. Um, but we drew a lot as well on our existing resources in the various different members and um, the experiences across our team as well. So we have um, some people who are you know, very skilled, for example, Vanessa on the design side, I'm more on the um, IT side, but we have broad range of skills across the team. And so we drew on that. And so sustainable kind of approach to how we designed this system um, meant that we drew on existing IT infrastructure a lot. Uh, the U University of Utrecht, for example, um, hosts a lot of the platforms that we use, uh, most if not all, but we also have um, our, you know, our merging technologies or other um, solutions that we add into that. But the majority of it is based on existing technologies across the alliance. Um, open source was our sort of uh, foundational principle. We wanted to be um, as open source as possible. Obviously, the, um, the CharmEU initiative is 
looks at the world through that kind of a lens and we're very happy to support that. Uh, we did find that open source isn't an ideal fit all of the time. And so our stack is actually a mixture of uh, proprietary systems, which we know we can get good support on. And then the open source pieces that we think are really uh, high potential that we wanted to add in. So um, I kind of like this slide because it you know, reminds me of a, a Lego game where you're putting the pieces together. So we, this is exactly what we did. We had these pieces, this box of uh, tools, which we composed into our solution. Um, other things, maybe, I suppose we can maybe just talk about um, user friendliness. Yeah, obviously that's a requirement. Um, with mixed skills in the cohort, obviously, we need to have a, a low bar to being able to access the systems. And um, security and privacy are fundamental to, to everything, obviously, these days. So uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, great. OK, so our design process, well, um, it looks quite formal here, but actually, um, we took quite an agile approach to this with lots of sub loops. So um, there was a collection of requirements, obviously, and as we said, that was informed by a very large group, um, which then fed into a kind of prototype design for our BLE. From here, we launched pilots. So we worked on a number of micro pilots with the uh, Work Package 7 around um, how the platform should be used. And those were used in a winter school in, Jake can remind me, I think it must have been um, 21, early 21. And so that went quite well. And we got some really good feedback from students on that, which further refined our design. Um, and then to kind of formalize the process in order for us to be able to talk about it internally in the teams, we worked with uh, user journey stories. So kind of um, I, as a user, want to achieve this particular goal. How do I get there? And um, then that was really useful in our discussions to, to have that to draw on. Um, and of course, there's an evaluation step to this. And we worked with uh, Work Package 7 on that quite a lot. Um, so feedback from Work Package 7 fed into our ultimate design as well. So um, yeah, next slide, please. Thank you. And back to you, Vanessa. Indeed, thank you. So yes, basically uh, we split all those um, those uh, uh, processes in three main phases, and we like to um, point out the fact that we built it different teams. Um, actually made of the same people, but formally uh, different teams uh, with different goals. The first one was to understand what we need, so to collect all those user stories uh, Daniel was talking about. Uh, this led us to, um, uh, to collect all the requirements, so uh, what we want to, um, to show to students, when, how, uh, with which, uh, tool and so on, and this was uh, was uh, led by the research teams. Uh, so basically, a collection and investigation of uh, the requirements with all the actors involved in uh, in uh, in the process. So the teaching staff, the students, mentors, and others well. And then we start building it uh, with two different teams, um, the unique VLE team, so in charge of the virtual part um, of the environment, and the unique hybrid classroom team in charge of designing uh, the physical spaces um, of charm. Uh, and then uh, we played hard uh, every every week. A meeting uh, to in an agile method uh, with with uh, some debriefing at the beginning. So how how is uh, going in Budapest? Where in Budapest we do have this. What what are you experiencing in Barcelona? In Barcelona we are missing that piece. So okay, what about Utrecht and so on? So that direct exchanges uh, during the second phases and uh, uh, the collective uh, intelligence to solve uh, um, all the obstacles. We, we encountered during this uh, process uh, to make it happen because uh, September was, uh, was uh, near and we needed the classroom and the environment to uh, provide uh, this unique experience, which is uh, the, ma the pilot master. And then uh, we opened uh, the hybrid classroom. So um, 
no, sorry, he's still in the previous slide. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, there the five hybrid classrooms um, actually live, connected with the, with the help of the VLE, so via, via Teams. And, uh, and then we realized actually that um, we needed another team to run the activities during the master. So from September 2021, uh, the unique teaching assistant team started their job. Uh, and their role is basically to facilitate the activities in the hybrid classroom. Thank you. Okay, so let's have a, a look uh, at the virtual part of the environment. Um, we design it as, as an onion with three different layers. We do have some core tools that allows um, uh, the master to run, uh, so the teaching and learning activities um, to, to operate. Um, those, uh, that core platform is made of mainly three platforms, one for communication MS Teams, then an LMS uh, Moodle, and then an ePortfolio platform, Scorium. So this is really what um, the basic, what we do need. Then we do have some flexible uh, technologies application in use, to, um, to enhance a little bit uh, the, the teaching and learning experience. And then we do have some uh, special innovative um, activities which are uh, in the emerging technology group. For example, some application where um, we provided some out of the building uh, activities to students uh, with the help of uh, geolocalized um, uh, route and uh, so on. We Maybe can we can see the example, things. yes, in, in the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so Marga, Marga gave the two minute warning three minutes ago. So let's plow through at super speed. Um, here are some examples of, um, well, the types of um, learning activities that we would provide on the VLE. And um, you can see some examples here. Um, I think we can probably make the slides available later. And the idea is really to kind of scaffold the learning with the virtual learning environment, and then that allows us to deploy exactly as needed on time. So we have a kind of a just-in-time delivery on that. And um, obviously, then we can kind of hit our zone of proximal development quite easily because we are hitting it exactly as needed or exactly when it's needed. Um, so let's fly ahead. We'll keep going. So thank you. Um, so the hybrid classroom, as I said, is kind of the core of everything. It's, um, we actually think of the hybrid space as an extension of the virtual space, and then learning happens in this kind of liminal space between the two, um, but they're always connected. So the hybrid classrooms are networked, uh, five of them across the Alliance, and they're always online. There's a camera facing the students, so everybody gets this experience of being able to see their peers all the time, and there's a great sense of connection in the room. Um, the room itself was designed with a quite flexible layout. So you can see here we opted for pods, which allows us to um, do small group breakouts quite easily. Um, but it's a very flexible space. All the furniture is on casters. It can be reorganized quite easily. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I can't even remember if this is me or you. So we've done so many different parts. We kind of do one another slides at this point. Um, here we have some examples of the types of modalities that the classroom can support. We typically have the one in the bottom left there where all students are in class and there's one teaching assistant in each of the classrooms. But as I said, it's very flexible space, so it can support all kinds of other arrangements. Um, yeah, like you get the point on that one. It's quite straightforward. Um, okay, so the types of activities. Uh, wanna... Yes, very, very shortly. So as long as you remember you are Daniel and then Vanessa, because Trying. sometimes, yes, <laughs> we get confused. So those are some activities that we do have uh, held in the hybrid classroom. You can see the different modalities. Actually, I would like to point out that the last picture of modality, so the one with the, all the square and one teaching assistant in the classroom, is the most used scenario. And uh, we do have some plenaries. The giant Jake in, in, in the screen, for example, is an, exam is an example of that. We do have uh, students connected uh, working in, in uh, hybrid work groups. And we do have also local groups in the last picture where, where my daughter is, Michelle, because we, 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 we feel so much being in, a, in the same family that sometimes the kids come uh, <laughs> to see what mom is doing. So yes, next slide, please. 
Okay, so looking forward, what we have uh, uh, learned from, from this, um, this experience, uh, well, maybe to take 30 seconds to think how, how much we did realize with such a small group of geeks. Actually, we, we realized uh, um, an entire environment, so it's nice to point out uh, that the ambition we, we shared actually had a, a good achievement. We, we achieved uh, the, the goal uh, we wanted to. Um, and uh, yes, about the lesson learned, maybe we can go to the next one. Sure. Like it to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as we said, we've published a, a very long list of these and we think that these are um, worthwhile contributions to the aims of the Digital Education Action Plan. Um, so things that we think are really important um, obviously, the integration of the technology, so that is a big challenge and it's something that uh, we haven't solved entirely, particularly around access to the systems. We have multiple accounts that we're juggling for students at the moment and uh, it is, you know, a single identity, um, but we can do better on that and we think that in Charmate there's a great opportunity to improve on that. Um, but the physical build across the Alliance is one that we think is important. So like developing standards for the types of equipment in the classroom and sharing that across the Alliance and um, you know, making sure that if there's a similar learning experience for all students in all the various classrooms. Um, we think that there is a need for a greater emphasis on staff development. And so this is something that we fed into the professional development group quite a lot. We've worked with them a fair bit. Um, and so, yeah, there's a learning curve, right? In order to be able to work in this space, you need to ramp up your skills and to be able to understand how to use the system. Um, time for testing, time for speaking. We're out of time pretty much, but time for testing is critical. Um, we found that, that um, yeah, that we, we possibly got lucky in that. So uh, testing should be like 20% minimum of any project. And uh, we tried to factor that in. And I think we keep going. So yeah, thank you. We're out, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, but yeah, so this is a, a set of the recommendations that we think are important, but we think that you should definitely uh, dive into our, our other material that we share with you. Yeah, I think we may need to come. No. Thank you very much, Margot, for your patience. And thank you very much to you. Everyone for your attention. Uh, really. Thank you very much, Vanessa and Daniel. Uh, really interesting experience. Uh, and we will continue talking with you uh, at the second part of the session. And now, as a second experience, we have Huratech. Uh, for the pilot of an automated course catalog, universities from the Huratech are using the SURF developed EduChange platform as a set site to present course information to, to students. This requires its partner university to connect internal systems to the OAPI via best point endpoints and collaborative agreement on the required data content and structure to allow for consistent presentation of course information on the catalog test site. Uh, there are a variety of handlers to overcome, technical uses relating to different students' information systems at each university, items relating to language and data format, plus some organization and process factors uh, that we are going to see. Uh, and we have Ben Parker, I suppose. Ben Parker is with us. Ben? Sorry. Hello. And, well, thank you. Uh, ben works at the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands as a project manager on the Hurotech Virtual Campus, mainly focuses uh, on the creation and release of an automated course catalog that will allow students to each university to find and enroll on Hurotech courses at the other partner institutions. Please, Ben, uh, share with us your experience. I can't see you uh, now. You can see me? Yes, hello. yes, hello. Perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. Um, that was an excellent introduction and summary of uh, what it is that we've been working on within Eurotech. So I feel like there's less of a need to introduce myself and just a, a 
a uh, thank you for letting me participate. Can you still hear me? It looks like I've frozen. I'll keep going just in case. So what I would like to do is talk through a little bit of the background to how this, uh, th this current catalog has come about, uh, all the steps that we've had to think through, how we have managed the partnership element of that and uh, found ways to agree on solutions, even though we're all in quite different settings across our alliance. You'll see the current members of our alliance there on the slide. There's six of us currently with two associate partners and potentially two more joining in the near future. So what I will do, um, I'll, I'll begin talking through the bigger picture, the current manual uh, setup for the catalog and where we've been looking at automation of the catalog. So here you see, we have uh, approximately 115,000 students across our university partners, which is slightly smaller than some of the examples I, I heard from yesterday who were uh, joining in. But we have this very clear and ambitious mobility goal of 50% of all of our graduates having a Eurotech mobility experience in the uh, duration of their studies. And in order to make that happen, one of the key parts is to have a a well-functioning course catalog that displays all the available courses from the partner institutions and allow students to uh, find relevant information so that they can uh, enroll and ensure that they actually can complete a course. Um, I'll talk through some of the key bits of data in, in a moment, um, but that is the big picture. We, we need to find a way of meeting this very ambitious goal of 50% of all students undertaking some mobility. So uh, last summer in 2021, uh, the, the pilot version of a manual catalog was created. This is the uh, effectively the same version that is still used at the moment. It's available on our Eurotech website. And um, uh, that requires uh, staff at each of the universities to collate all the necessary course information, make it available to a, a central person who collates it uh, again, um, and then it is published as a one-off snapshot of courses that are available. It's good, it works, it means students can see the, the courses at each of the partner institutions and then contact the relevant uh, individuals at those institutions to begin the enrollment process. Um, at the moment, there are varying uh, numbers of courses available from each of the universities. And we've got some data that I'll show you shortly about how many students uh, enroll and participate on those courses. And then in the meantime, for about the last year, uh, there has been work underway on developing a, an IT supported automated version of a course catalog. And the reason that, that is so important is because it will allow the scale up of uh, courses. At the moment, we're talking about this level, we need to uh, increase it hugely if we're going to get anywhere close to that um, target of 50% mobility. So I'll show you some of the current manual process and then the automated version. This is what it looks like. This gives you an idea of some of the key fields that need to be uh, collected from each of our universities to show the title of a course, subject area, which level a student would be studying at, and very importantly, uh, the format. We've just heard about uh, examples of how you can deliver in different formats. Um, when a course begins and ends is super important. That's what it looks like currently. And the information itself on the automated version will look largely very similar, but the process behind it will uh, be quite different. These are some of the figures from the latest run about where our students go, how many students participate from each university and which other universities they go to. We get an idea of which courses are most popular based on subject area. We get an understanding of how students like to study uh, in the format in which a course is delivered. And all of this is really important when we think through the, the, the design and execution of an automated version of the catalog. Um, we've had it reiterated by our Eurotech management board that we are pursuing this target of 50% mobility by 2030. And half of that total mobility will be through virtual or hybrid learning, which is where, again, a, a well-functioning automated course catalog is a huge uh, building block in making that happen. 
Uh, we want to reduce manual bottlenecks at the moment while we're piloting things. There are still some manual processes that are important and work well and work for the number of students we're talking about. But increasing to the scale that we desire means that we need to try and reduce those manual bottlenecks and uh, increase automation of the bits that can be automated. Uh, we asked the, uh, the, the group, a lot, lots of this data has come from excellent colleagues of mine. It's not uh, something I've been uh, particularly involved in. But there was a question asked to the group who had put together and um, supported the manual catalog so far about what do you think is the maximum number of student applications we could handle through the current process? And generally, even the most ambitious thought we could maybe double the number of students who are uh, applying for courses and undertaking courses uh, through this Eurotech catalog, which shows just how crucial automation is to be able to serve the wider student body, uh, to be able to offer the number of courses we wish to offer and to have students who are able to enroll on those courses. So that's a, a picture. There's a couple of slides I wanted to show you, which give you, a, a, hopefully, an understanding of some of the complexities involved. From my perspective, as a project manager working on this automation side, the technical solutions are of particular interest to me, but there are so many other factors around uh, processes or national differences, um, things that are bespoke to a particular university. And this, this slide shows you the timeline of how course information is currently collected for the, uh, the Eurotech course catalog. It shows there are lots of steps, how long it takes to gather and uh, check all that information, how to make it public, how to publicize and market it. There are a couple of lines in there that are specific to one or two universities. And then how we maximize people uh, actually taking up uh, the, the spaces on courses. We want to make sure courses are full and that students complete. We don't want a, a high dropout rate. And then this is one of my favorites or least favorites, depending on the day. It shows, um, it's, it's one of the first things I saw when I started in post as well. And it shows the, the uh, academic year structures of each of our partner universities. And you can see clearly the different colors represent different chunks of the year. When classes run, when exam periods run, uh, when uh, students are able to enroll for courses. And you'll see there's quite a lot of variety there. So even on something as, as fundamental as the structure of an academic year, uh, you can see there are uh, this this is a, a potential source of challenges because when we make courses available in a catalog might determine when students from each ind uh, individual university are able to enroll they might be selecting their home modules at a very different time to when eurotech modules have become available so that's just one to keep in mind in terms of structural complexity uh, before we talk about um the automated catalog this now uh, is is uh, the stage where I'll talk about what we've done in terms of automation. There's some wonderful work that has been uh, developed building on top of the the uh, excellent manual process that has uh, done the job so far. And we have four partner universities connected to this system, two currently joining, which is good. We have some uh, uh, unanimity and working together here. What we're using, um, as Margaret mentioned, is a, uh, a, a tool called EduExchange. And this is developed by SURF, an extension, a uh, collaborative extension of the Dutch universities and education institutions. And using their API, it pulls all the necessary course information to a catalog website automatically. So where is the manual catalog? It's a snapshot of published information. This is regular updated uh, live information. So if anything needs to change about an offering of a course, we would see it reflected in the course catalog. At the moment, we're at the stage where we have a, a proof of concept, a almost working version, uh, which displays that course information, the course data itself. And starting from next year, we'll be looking uh, in earnest at the enrollment stages, which will be incredibly helpful. 
and challenging. And then the grades transfer side of things, how a student, uh, so enrollment, how a student actually uh, signs up and registers for a course, how necessary information about that student is passed to the guest institution. We want to make it so that uh, a student can use existing identification and authentication methods. And then for the third step, the grading, um, how the guest institution returns the necessary results and grades to both the student and to the home institution, because we want to make sure that credits are recognized and count as part of a, uh, a student's course of study. This is what it currently looks like. So um, you can, uh, this is still just a test site, it's not publicly available. We want to uh, make sure over the next few months, we're going to compare the data that displays on our, our test automated catalog and check it against the current manual catalog to see that all the information is present. Um, if I as a student go onto this website, I can select which university is my home university that immediately filters the courses down to uh, those that are available from partner institutions. I can then uh, search for a course, show all courses or select based on a particular university I want to uh, study at. And then you can filter by all number, all manner of different things. So when a course begins, how many credits I may get from it, uh, what particular subject area I am after, whether that's very relevant to my course or I'm looking for something slightly different. Um, and when you uh, select a course, all this information is being pulled directly from, in this case, Taltech's student information system. So I can be confident that this is up to date, to up to date and correct information. At the moment, uh, if I were to then try and register, that would go through the manual registration process. But that's where we'll be looking at uh, uh, automating enrollment as well in the coming steps. But this is super helpful because it means that uh, rather than there needing to be lots of work each time we uh, publish a catalog, instead, all we need to do is ensure that courses are marked as available for Eurotech and uh, a couple of extra information fields they will then display as present and correct on this automated catalog. Some of the data fields I've mentioned, this has been a, a, a challenge. We have a working group across the universities in our alliance. So this isn't uh, something decided by one or two people, but we agree consensus in how we do things. And that's very important because we have potentially lots of different uh, systems in our different nations, different ways of doing things, maybe because of other structural things like the, the uh, structure of an academic year. Um, but we needed to agree, again, based on work done by the manual group, manual catalog group, what are the key data fields required? Do we have those represented and available in our, uh, in our own systems? Does the API that we're using from SURF have relevant fields that mean that each each data field aligns perfectly. Um, how do we function in terms of uh, language of data, language of course information as it's displayed? Do we have a clear and consistent way of categorizing the formats that we're describing our courses in? Same is true for subject area and theme. And I've got an example here of how that information is displayed. This is a website about the open education API that we use uh, from SURF. And this is how we've agreed courses are marked as available for Eurotech as an alliance and which theme or subject area they fall under. So these are agreed between our universities as common uh, subject areas, because even though we're a group of technical and engineering universities, it's quite easy to categorize courses in slightly different ways. So this is a very, very important uh, factor in a, how we present the data, but B, how a student as a user will experience the catalog. Um, we've also had to think through data that we don't include for now. Uh, you could have so, so much information included on a catalog site. We've had to rationalize and make sure that the information that is there is essential and useful, um, but that uh, we keep it streamlined to some extent and consistent consistency is then across our then excuse me two minutes yep no problem yeah. sorry so um that is where we've got to uh as we stand we have a a functioning proof of concept for the course information part 
Um, the next steps are complicated, but really add value. So uh, this is based on a system that's used by an existing uh, or existing alliances within the Netherlands. We know that we have uh, a way of uh, installing functionality for enrollment, that a student can see a course, enroll in a course, and data can be passed between universities as necessary. But we have to work out how, how, we, uh, how we adapt this um, for the universities we have, the different national settings and uh, national factors to consider. Any other legislation around data protection and uh, student information. So those are the big next steps. Course data is looking very, very promising. We've had a huge amount of progress on that front and should be ready to uh, make this automated version of the catalog the, the live version in the next few months. The enrollment functionality is then our big step. Uh, and beyond that's the results and grade transfer. So we are always interested to, to hear what's going on elsewhere. We are looking to make sure we're building towards something that is standardized and uh, future proof. So when we talk about interoperability, it doesn't necessarily mean we just use one system. Uh, that's not always easy to change. It's not necessarily in our control, but that the things that we're building are uh, flexible, adaptable, and can be aligned with other systems all based on standardization across Europe and potentially wider. So that's the, the one of the key topics we have in mind. So I'll leave you, final point, um, some of the successes and challenges. You see my favorite or least favorite uh, image of the, the term times, the academic year structure, one of the foundational aspects of complexity that we face. And that's not a technical thing at all. It's a, a structural one. But we've got to the point where we have a, uh, a, a functioning catalog that uh, displays information automatically from home institution systems. Uh, we know what most of those aspects of com complexity are. We've had real success in terms of agreeing consistency between our universities and this technical working group that we have from each of the partner universities. We meet regularly to discuss uh, what are the key next steps? Are we in agreement on our solutions? Which uh, manual process or national varieties do we need to consider? Uh, as remaining and what can we change and automate sooner rather than later. So as a real success, we've had healthy, um, uh, regular and iterative discussions on our approach. We've got uh, current agreement uh, and are looking to progress as a group. And there is real innovation, uh, an innovation mindset in terms of how we keep that big picture mobility goal in mind, how we can work towards meeting it and what are the smaller term steps to uh, to make sure that we do that and do it well so that it's future-proofed, standardized, that we are aware of other things happening across Europe um, so that we're building towards something that, that uh, will work for the longer term as well. So that's a short summary from me. I'm very happy to hand back over and hear any questions later, but thank you for the chance to share a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, and I found it very, very interesting to hear about all the other aspects from different alliances, but particularly from Charm. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, and now we have the best practice uh, example, Metacampus from the Unite Alliance. Ah, well, can you try? <laughs> Sorry. Well. This is Jesus Alcover from the University Universitat Politécnica de Catalunya, the Barcelona Tech. And well, Unite means University Network for Innovation, Technology and Engineering, and is a European University Alliance of nine partners. Uh, this digital infrastructure. Well, they they have created the Meta Campus. Uh, that is the meeting point of the United Community, which uh, fosters the collaboration and communication among the stakeholders of the Alliance. And this digital infrastructure uh, uses a centralized model system. And the presentation will show the Meta Campus concept and existing implementation, for example, the, the EduGain. And additionally, yes, uh, Jesus addresses changes, uh, challenges and needs which are shared by other alliance uh, for further European-wide collaboration. 
And, and we say uh, with us are Jesus Alcover, is an engineering and PhD in telecommunications from the Universidad Politécnica de Catalunya, UPC. And he is delegate of the UPC Rector for the Unite Digital Campus and the Vice Director of the Institute of Education Science in UPC. He belongs to the Network Engineering Department and he teaches in the Castellfell School of Telecommunications and Aerospace Engineering. And his area of interest is based on the learning management systems, uh, service management systems, and in health. Mm -hmm. And well, okay. uh, we are looking forward to learn about your experience, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Marga. And thank you, Jan, for offering us the opportunity to share with you all our experiences from our alliance. Yeah, it's curious because when I arrived here that I don't know your alliance, but I'm quite familiar because we are meeting in our alliances in a similar way. And I think that it's a good opportunity to share you know, with uh, our experiences. Uh, first of all, let me check. Now I'm, I, I'm, 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 now I'm not, I know how my students suffer when they are sitting in the last row. Because Okay, yes, I think I have to go in this. No, no. Oh, yes. Ah, it's your finger. Oh, well, I, <laughs> it's the remote finger. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, uh, for sure you don't know a lot about uh, the Alliance, uh, United Alliance. We are, we have just finished in November the first uh, project, uh, Erasmus Plus project. Uh, we were at that time seven partners from different countries, uh, and now on, in November we started uh, the new the new project with two additional partners. Uh, we are from the University of Lisbon, UPC in Spain, Grenoble in France, Polito in Italy, Darmstadt, Graz, Alto, Finland, KTH. And uh, we are quite different, you know. And what we have in common that we are uh, engineering, uh, engineering uh, universities, okay. And uh, we we use sorry, we use uh, the meta campus. We've built the meta campus uh, because we needed a digital platform. Think about the digital platform, not only the place, not only the platform for the courses. Okay? Obviously, we are universities and we are offering courses to our students. But we, in our, uh, in our community, we have students, we have staff, and we have academia. Okay? And our customers are all of them. Okay? And uh, different activities, that different members of the unite community they offer they think about it they find in the meta campus the place where they can make it happen okay and that means that the meta campus is the enabler of these unite activities and communities okay this is very very important because uh, the, the concept is broader it's not an even though we are finally we are going to use a learning management system that is Moodle, it's, we, you know, our concept is broader. There are lots of activities that within the Unite community we 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 do. Just okay. And uh, the different users of the of Unite, they are thinking about the Meta Campus as a kind of a service. And this is one of the main challenges, okay? Because uh, we are an alliance and we are within a project. The project it has a Gantt chart, they have objectives, but uh, when you are offering a kind of service, your users are expecting a service, they are not thinking on a Gantt chart. They are thinking on SLAs, you know, service level agreements. They are thinking on KPIs. And we have to manage these both worlds. Okay? We are in a project, but we are offering a kind of service. 
Okay. And uh, in digital campus uh, is one of Meta Campus is part of the digital campus, and we are in we are in a specific work package in, in the next project. And as we mentioned before, uh, this uh, Meta Campus is the, the meeting point, okay, the meeting point of the community. Okay, even though uh, technologically uh, this is a virtual campus made of, uh, it's a, a learning management system. Okay, but in this Meta Campus we allow us we allow us to uh, offer the possibility to create community. Again, community is, is community of students, community of uh, staff, community of teachers, uh, in hybrid communities, yeah, whatever. Okay. And we are using, uh, as a, a, a technologically speaking, we're using uh, an open source platform, is Moodle. Uh, one of the reasons to use this is because it's an open source platform, it's a kind of de facto standard of the learning management system. Okay. But again, the learning management system is not the whole system. Uh, most of the of, uh, Unite, except KTH, that they are using Canvas, the rest of the partners are using Moodle. And it's a good approach because all of us are familiar. All of us, remember, one of the pillars of the community is staff. Most of the staff, they haven't seen or they haven't heard about Moodle before. Okay, it's important to be aware of this. But anyway, we use Moodle okay, because we are familiar with this. It's an open source. And by default, by design, they are offering the GDPR compliance. Okay, but this is not enough because all the partners have different, even though we have the umbrella of the GDPR, the different countries have different, different requirements, less and or, or, or more restrict. Uh, and it's important to take into account this. The second thing is that the Moodle platform is accessible by default, it's double A, but it's not enough. Why? Because you, have, you can have a, a platform that is accessible, no? But if I'm a professor and I upload a content that is not accessible, we don't have an accessible platform. It's very important to be aware of this. That means that the users require training because you can have a platform that is accessible, but if the contents are not accessible, okay, the user, the final user, will not be able to access to this content in a proper way. And the third one is the multilingual, and it's a very, very challenging. We in Unite, we are nine partners. We have nine languages. None of us use <coughs> English as a third language, first language. There are two partners that are sharing language. This is Graz and Darmstadt. They are sharing Deutsch in German. And we in UPC, we are using two. Catalan and Spanish, we are different, okay? But this is very challenging. Why? Because again, we can, Moodle is multilingual by default, by design. Okay? We can change, we can just configure and have another language. But if the users are not, the users are not uploading, using other languages apart from English, finally, at the end, we are going to use only English. We have to make an effort of this, very important. And uh, examples of, uh, in Moodle, we, the, the terminology they use is courses, but we are not using the, the, the terminology courses. We are using spaces, because the place where the different users interact each other, okay? We have, we have examples, for example, teaching and learning academy. The teaching and learning academy is training for teaching, teachers, for professors, we are, we are not, they are students, but they are not students. They are, we say, they are participants, okay? But in the Meta Campus, you can find as well hackathons. We can, yes, offer hackathons. We have a multicultural, multilingual training center, okay? Where the different universities offer language courses, for example. Or these are language tandems, another activity that is not related with the regular uh, courses, okay? Uh, activities such as student co-creation, these activities that 
that offer or they are promoted by different uh, web packages. And finally, we have the option to join program that is the most challenging, as we have seen in the previous <coughs> uh, explanation, no? in the previous presentation, that we have a lot of challenges with this. Okay. And from the technology point of view, remember, we are using Moodle and we are uh, using Edugain as an authentication system because it's all the users are, gonna, are, are able to access to the system with their, their home credentials. It's very important. We are, uh, we are, we have developed the, the course catalog uh, using a search engine because, again, for us, it's not only a course catalog because our customers, for example, the students, are looking for internships. They are looking for PhD offers. They are looking for master thesis offers. They are looking for a lot of things apart from courses. Then we have to open you know, the scope. Okay. And the course catalog is one of the most important part of the catalog for sure. And this is a challenge. Okay. And in order to offer from the, from the home system courses to the rest of the partners, we are we have been studying, we have, we have used the LTI technology. LTI means learning tools interoperability. This technology allows us to, for example, in my case, as a teacher in my school, I offer my course in my Moodle system to other students in another university without replicating my content, okay? without replicating, using LTI. Okay? The thing is that we have uh, analyzed because we is an example uh, is a clear example of challenges in the alliances. We have tested the LTI and it's, it's running perfectly well. And when we said, okay, we have finished the test, we can move it to the exploitation and the service, uh, the IT service team said, what? No, no, we have to to make a kind of feasibility report, feasibility study. And once finish this feasibility study, they give us a long list of concerns about this. Okay. That means that we have to work with, for example, the LTI. Okay. And sorry, because I'm just moving around. <laughs> uh, well, this is the, the, here you can access the using it again, the United Community can access the the, the system, okay, this is the, the, the link. And yes, please go ahead and this is the second. And yes, go, go, because I used to, yes. Oh, sorry, because <laughs> I, okay. Uh, because I cannot see this. Okay, yes, uh, just figures, figures about what we have done so far. There are one th more than 1,000, 1,300 uh, students registered, means that they have access to this place. We have uh, spaces uh, with different amount of participants. Okay, you can, you can see in this, the different analytics of the metacampus that we have from this last year, means from to, to last week and the, day, uh, the, the year uh, before, we have these 5,000. 5,000 euro, uh, 5,000 users, and this three minutes and a half average uh, time, okay, the, the, of the session for the users. We have this, uh, the, the Metacampus is, has not a specific ap application, or application, they are using uh, the web, and we have um, this uh, 70, more than 75 percent of the users using the desktop, okay. And the, the traffic that we, we are not using for sure, and we are not using advertising, that means that we are, our traffic is coming just directly to, to us. Okay. And then it's a list of the main, the list of the main, the main, uh, the main spaces with more, more users. Uh, and you, well, you, for example, the first one is for training teachers. The second one was a boot camp where different participants, different teachers, staff, and students participate. The third one is in a spring school. But different examples that some of them are courses, some of them have activities. We have mentoring, okay? we have language tandems, we have different activities, not only specific for courses. It's very important. One of the characteristics of the Meta Campus is, is that in the Meta Campus, any user can have any role. That means that if there is a student 
offering an activity and they want to be editors, having the teaching role in this activity, they can do it because the Meta Campus is, is, uh, is a centralized system in, in, uh, in, in, in UNITE. And then, yes. Well, this is just figures mm, then with the, the users that have been used the, the, the Meta Campus, just to, to reflect that there has been activity, these 5,000 users in the last year, this average time, it, uh, you can see different activities no? in the, during this, this, this year. And yes. well, this is an example that I mentioned before, the Multicultural Multilingual Training Center, with different organizers. In this case, the organizers are not teachers, are staff members of the, of the universities. Okay. Apart from the LTI technology, apart from the LTI technology, we offer as well open batches. We are using Open Batch Factory and we're using open batches as well. We are issuing open, we are creating and issuing open batches for the different activities that they require. We have another experience as well with this. It is another open, open field. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the challenges, well, the challenges you can see that these are the similar challenges that you have seen so far. The main challenge is the exchange of information between the different partners. There is the, there is the connectivity, the different learning management systems with the, with the Meta Campus. Okay. And first level support means that the users expect a service from us and we are within a, a project. There's a challenge that we have to deal with. Okay. And the virtual request processes, the, 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 the users are required, are requiring, they are coming to us, we are doing a kind of consultant service. We have this problem, how can we solve it? And we offer options, solutions to this, okay? And what is important for us, and it is a common, a common issue for all the partners, is all the European projects that are now in, in place. Okay. The Erasmus of papers, for example, we can work in a, a course catalog, but maybe from the Erasmus of papers, there is an API that they are offering this course catalog. And we have to be aware of this. Okay. Otherwise, we will maybe we'll create something that is not compatible with our, or we are duplicating efforts. Uh, apart from this, we have our other European projects, such as the European Student Card and uh, My Academic ID, that we want to work on the following months in the next edition of the. Erasmus Plus project in Unite. Okay, and thank you. This is my my speech. Okay, um, now we had have we have had three talks about European universities, and the fourth and the last speaker for today is talking from. Uh, the perspective of uh, IT organizations who can support us as European universities. So we are very glad that Christine Bock from SURF, IT, the public IT organization from the Netherlands, and she's also a board member of UNIS, is um, here to give us a speech. And Christine will talk about the current European landscape of digital services and standards for education that is complex and fragmented. All 44 European University alliances also need to develop solutions, which only adds to the complexity. There is insufficient cooperation between existing initiatives and a lack of coordination and governance to achieve a European digital ecosystem for education that ensures interoperability and that is based on the public values. And Christine will explain more about this, uh, about two initiatives. Um, that have been taken by SURF. Um, Christine is an innovation manager education at SURF. She aims to support collaboration between higher education institutes in the field of IT innovation in order to improve student success and the quality of education. And she's an advocate for the protection of public values in education and research. She's convinced that international agreements on standards and architecture are a key to organize education efficiently and flexible, nationally and across borders. Christine Desires designed various national innovation programs, including Acceleration Plan, 
with uh, a 60 million amount of money funded by the, Euro by the government of the Netherlands and a digitalization impulse for education, a 600 million funded program, which will start in 2023. And Christine studied Dutch literature at Utrecht University. She worked for the Dutch Foundation for Literature and at the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. And uh, she was responsible for the research program in which IT researchers and heritage managers work together to make heritage available digitally. Christine, welcome. Thank you, Jan. The floor is yours. Thank you. And thanks for the introduction. Um, um, I would like to tell a little bit about uh, trains. Uh, I really like trains and I think in the Netherlands uh, we have our national railways very well organized. This is a picture of uh, Utrecht uh, Central Station. That's the station uh, in the city where I live. It's the biggest station in the Netherlands. And um, well, I think the, the trains um, in the Netherlands, they run on time and they are safe. Um, uh, at, at some lanes, they even run every 10 minutes. So it's a real um, well-organized system. And you can see the yellow um, uh, poles at the entrance of the station. And then you can just put your OV chip card, as it, it's called, and um, the doors open and uh, uh, the amount of money that you need to pay is automatically uh, paid from your card. So that's a really well-organized national railway system. Um, we don't only have a national uh, railway system, we also have regional uh, railways. Uh, so you see here a list of the regional lines as well. So there are quite a number of that. And uh, you see that they uh, mostly uh, are running in the more remote parts of the Netherlands. And, uh, but that's also really well organized because if you want to uh, book um, a train traveling, uh, for example, which uh, need where you need uh, um, uh, uh, the national railway and the regional railway, you just can book uh, the, uh, the train in one app and you can use uh, the same OV chip card. Um, the only thing with the OV chip card is that you have to check in and check out to, to get to the different trains, but it's on the same platform, so it's relatively easy. Um, so when it comes to uh, international traveling, uh, that's a different story. Um, then it becomes more difficult. And there is no uh, one timetable uh, to book your uh, trains to uh, when you want to, for example, to travel to Italy or uh, even further from the Netherlands. And um, there are not very well connected trains to certain uh, destinations. For example, if I take a train from Utrecht to Marseille, that's 1100 kilometers, it only takes me six hours. But if I want to travel to Copenhagen, uh, it, it's 600 kilometers and it takes me uh, more than 12 hours. So, um, there is a lot of improvement, uh, um, room for improvement when it comes to international uh, traveling. And well, the European Commission sees the same. So they uh, announced 2022 as the year of the train. And uh, what they are aiming for is full integration of um, uh, the European railways and to, to reduce costs and to increase the capacity of the railway and also to enhance flexibility and reliability. And that is not only uh, ask for uh, investments in the physical uh, infrastructure, but also in systems, in regulation, in agreements, and also digitization, of course, uh, plays a very important role. So um, when you look at the trains, um, and not a lot of improvement was taking place um, uh, in 2022. So uh, the um, Frans Timmerman, uh, he is uh, from uh, the European Commission, he said, well, if you don't improve um, the the railway in, in, in the sense that we, uh, of our ambitions, and then I will force you, enforce you with one ticketing system and one timetable. So then you cannot develop it yourself, but I will just say uh, what you need to do. And of course, to do so, this uh, needs an integrated effort and up till now for uh, the European member states it's really different uh, to come up with that collaboration. So when we take a look at student mobility, 
um, that is also growing. Uh, right now, over 10 million students have been studied in the Erasmus Plus program since 1987. Uh, there are uh, more than 300,000 students uh, uh, in that program every year. And as Jan and, and as you all know, of course, there are um, 44 European uh, universities that even enhance the student, international student mobility in Europe. And of course, uh, here as well, uh, digitization uh, uh, plays a very important role uh, to uh, make it easy and possible uh, to give more reliable and scalable administration to organize this uh, student mobility. And it asks for interoperability be between apps and tools, uh, for example, when it comes to credentials. Um, so in a way, there is a similarity similarity of course between uh, the, the 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 railways um and i i think just as the railways we can do better um and why is that um, um because uh, the student mobility doesn't stop within our own context <clears throat> so it's not in the national context as we see at a national railway you can organize your um, uh, national railway very well but it doesn't help you when you want to uh, travel internationally. The same is, of course, with the European universities. You are all organizing the collaboration between your European university. And that's, of course, very logical because that's what you are um, uh, aimed for. Uh, but there are there is more uh, um, mobility besides uh, the, uh, the European universities um, themselves. So, for example, if you take one university, uh, they are struggling with the interoperability within their own institution, because most of the time we have systems within the universities that are not interoperable. There are sometimes national uh, regulations or agreements that uh, universities have to come up with. Sometimes universities, uh, and in the Netherlands, for example, there are 14 universities now are member of European universities. And in that context, they are also working on interoperability and integrations. Of course, we have also the Erasmus Plus program and it also has some uh, IT projects. So it is possible that in within one university, you are working on three different solutions for exactly the same problem. So I think also in the universities, in the educational sector, we should do better. And of course we should do better to facilitate our students. Uh, because it hinders our students that we are not collaborating enough. Uh, the, the re, the, for students, it means that it's an administrative, uh, well, bad dream uh, in the best way. And uh, most of the time, it's a nightmare to organize this interoperability, especially when it's outside, uh, for example, bilateral agreements between universities or within a European university where you are organizing it really well, but maybe they want to go outside those contexts. So I think we should do better because I think at different places we are reinventing the wheel. And again, this is not helping our students. What we need to do is to really organize interoperability. And that doesn't mean that we all need to, to use the same things. That's exactly what Ben was talking about in his presentation. You have to be flexible and use standards, open standards and have um, uh, architectural principles that guide you. Um, so, and that of course needs coordination. This is a picture uh, of the control room of uh, in Utrecht uh, Central Station. Um, this is a, a control room where we organize that the trains all run in time and that everything is working well. And when it comes to uh, organizing interoperability in the European context, there is no such control room. And I already mentioned what uh, Frans Timmerman was saying to the railways, uh, the, the national railways, that they really should collaborate because if they would not do that, he would enforce them solutions. Well, that's never going to happen in the educational sector because we have autonomy of education in Europe. And that's great good because autonomy of education is really, really important. It's one of our public values that uh, universities are autonomous in the way they deliver their uh, education and in the way they design their educational programs. So that is really important. 
But when it comes to organizing education, so making education possible, then it's not very uh, convenient to stick to this uh, um, uh, autonomy. So I really think that we meet, need to make a distinction between autonomy of the educational programs and the pedagogy and on organize, organizing education. And when it comes to organizing education, I really think we should collaborate more and have some kind of a control room to organize this um, collaboration. And that is something that is not there right now in our educational landscape. There are some things also in the talk of Ben, uh, it's not only about organizing technical interoperability. The technical part is not the most um, uh, difficult part. We also need to work on semantic interoperability. So what do we mean uh, when we are talking about um, the outcomes of a course, uh, the ECTS, uh, the, the, uh, the grades that um, uh, students have? It, it also comes to organizational um, uh, interoperability and also about legal operability, interoperability because there are, of course, different laws in different countries that mean different things when it comes to organizing interoperability. So this is really, uh, uh, well, a, a, a quite a, a difficult problem that we need to solve uh, with each other. And the thing is, as I said before, there is not right now a logical place where this organization um, uh, will be organized. There's not a logical party where we can go to and say, help us to organize this interoperability. But again, I really think collaboration is key. As I said before, a student journey doesn't stop at the walls of a campus or of a European university. And because we all work on point solution, I think we waste public money, brain power, and expertise by investing in these point solutions. And that is also a risk. It's not only the risk of wasting this money and brain power, and the, and the brain power and the expertise, of course, is scarce, uh, but it's also a real risk uh, because I'm convinced that big tech, ed tech companies uh, are ready to provide infrastructure on commercial terms, um, and that uh, gives the risk of vendor lock in. If you take a look at the investments of EdTech. Uh, last year, they invested uh, 20 billion euro in education. And of course, education, it's a real profitable market for them because every second a new student is born. So to get into this market um, is very profitable for them. And I really think that is a big risk and we should take this into account. And another point is that the fragmentation that we are working on right now hinders our own innovation power. So we will be very much stronger in um, making innovation possible if we would collaborate more. So that is the reason why um, at SURF we started this the international discussion. And uh, I will tell you a little bit about a few things that we did. Um, the we 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 organized a few workshops on this topic, and we also invited um, uh, representatives from uh, 4U1 and 4U2, because we think that the European universities are a really important partner in this whole discussion. And we started this workshop to, uh, to think about an, an European digital ecosystem for education based on public values. So what does it mean? What does it ask for us? As I said before, it's not about all using the same system. It's about organizing interoperability. So what do we need to do? How can we work on not only the technical interoperability, but also the semantic, the organizational and the legal interoperability? What does it ask from us? What kind of responsibility can we take to achieve this goal? So right now there is a think tank of 13 people and there are representatives in this think tanks from uh, seven countries. And we are trying to come up with a vision paper, trying to, to map what is out there and what is missing and what we should do to take next steps. One of the initiatives that we took at SURF is the development of a proof of concept. It's called ADU Access. And in this proof of concept, we try to map all the solutions that are already there. Solutions for organizing education. 
you were talking, for example, about the necessity of a course catalog. You have to um, have something for the admission of your students. Well, there are a lot of solutions already out there, but not always they are known. It's not always an, um, clear how interoperable they are. So we really think that it's important that we have this overview where, for example, European universities, but also uh, in other contexts, people just can look up, is there a solution for a problem that we have? Because let's, let's be real, if it comes to education, we all have the same problems. So it's really relatively easy to categorize uh, all these solutions that are already out there. And so the proof of concept we presented at some workshops and there is enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm for it. And we're trying to get some funding to really uh, develop a kind of a database that really gives you insight in what's already there and how you can use it. And the other thing is that we have been working with the Digital Education Hub, and that's an initiative of the European Commission. And in this context, we also discuss this um, question on inter organizing interoperability. And also we see that the European Commission is, well, very interested in, in what we are thinking about and how we want to achieve it. We call it a kind of um, Bologna Declaration 2.0. The Bologna Declaration uh, was uh, set out to harmonize the, edu uh, uh, the uh, educational infrastructure in Europe. And we think a Bologna Declaration 2.0 should ha be aimed at harmonizing the digital infrastructure for education. If it needs to be um, an initiative within the Bologna process, we don't know yet. We are still looking what the best ways are to achieve this goal. But we are having the, this discussion also in the context of the Digital Education Hub. And at last, uh, Jan already told me I'm working for an NREN, a national research and education network. And every country, almost every country in the world, but every country in Europe has an NREN. And Géant is the organization uh, where all the European NRENs collaborate. So we already also reached out to Géant to, to investigate if Géant could play a role in uh, the questions that, for example, the European University have. Uh, because for you, you in your own context of your own European university, you have to solve a problem, but your colleague of another university has to solve the same problem. So would it be possible to organize a kind of place where all European universities would go to and just send in their questions so that we could see, are there the same questions? Are there already solutions out there that we could just offer them? Is there a way for service delivery for European universities? So that's what we are exploring uh, with Géant, if that will be possible. And there already are some NRENs, for example, Sweden, Finland, the Netherlands, um, uh, Switzerland, that are really willing to offer their solutions that are already out there for European universities. So that is in short uh, what we are working on. Uh, we have high ambitions. Um, we really um, have the ambitions to come up with a common digital infrastructure for education in Europe. And uh, we really hope uh, that not only we can help you, but also that we can collaborate because we really need each other, especially in this landscape where there is no clear place where the responsibility lies. It's really important that we all take the responsibility. So that's why we are really happy that 4 u one and 4 u 2 are really involved in our discussion. And we are hoping that next year we can make uh, big steps further at, in achieving uh, what will be beneficial for our students and, and organize for our students the interoperability that is needed to facilitate uh, their mobility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christine. I uh, cannot agree more that due to the development of European universities, we are now in the situation and we have the opportunity to work together as European universities more than ever. And the 4EU1, 4EU+, plus, maybe not everyone knows this, but these are the subgroups where the alliances work together. And the European uni University asking us to work together instead of competing. So this is a great chance for us to make these uh, uh, further steps on digitalization. Um, due to time, um, 
Well, we started a little bit later, uh, but uh, actually we are already in uh, the coffee break. Uh, but we discussed, uh, we will give uh, the audience the chance to, to come up with one urgent question. Is there anyone? Anyone? No? Um, then, then I will raise this question um, for the audience, for uh, Christine and for the others. Um, can you come up with uh, uh, what is the most urgent issue that we need to solve in the coming three, four years? Can I? Yes? I, I can start. Yeah, thank you. Um, I couldn't agree more with Christine that uh, interoperability is something that should have been solved a long time ago. It's a, a solved problem in other domains, but it seems to just lag in education. So um, being able to solve that would, um, you know, streamline a lot of the processes that we have. Um, a question that I might bounce to Christine actually is how do we solve it internally? So um, you talked about um, yeah, internal systems. So uh, if you have advice maybe on working with information, you know, your IT services departments within universities, I think that maybe is the harder thing. So interop at the institutional level is okay once you get past the structural challenges of you know trying to decide can we do this or should we do this. Um, but being able to work with legacy systems within IT departments is a real challenge, I think, and trying to connect those things like academic registry or even human resources for staff, these types of things need to be interop as well. So um, those are what I see as the big challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Anyone else? Yes, I will also add maybe uh, the importance to, to split and to, to underline technology as, um, as a media to operate and technology as a media to enrich uh, the learning experience. So I, I will stress a little bit on, on this point as well. So it's important to have the interoperability of systems uh, to operate in, in an easier manner. <clears throat> but at the same time, it's important to let the space for innovation in the teaching and learning experience. So to keep this hummus of innovation, it's important to me. Thank you. This is yes, but more or less in the same line is integrity is the main, the main aspect. And I would say as well, kind of governance, no? in the sense that we unite, for example, uh, as in terms of you, we, we are not, uh, we have not, not, at least so far, we are not a legal entity. And it, it provokes a lot of inconvenience. No? But even though we were a legal entity, uh, the, the systems that we are using are completely different in our university than in other universities. And I will just post an example. In UPC, we have Google Workspace. In France, it's forbidden to use this. Okay, can we? Can, how can we collaborate in this way that we have our tools in this way in this case google and in france they are not they cannot use it then that means that we have to change no because we cannot use our system we can and a lot of challenges that we have to deal with no? thank you okay thank you uh, ben christine well um I think there are a really important um, remarks that you make, uh, for example, when it comes to the legacy uh, of in universities. Um, when I look at the Netherlands, we are, as you mentioned, starting uh, this really big national program next year. And that's, of course, the biggest discussion. How do you come from these point solutions to national solutions and even from national solutions to European solutions? I, I, I totally agree that that is a, one of the biggest challenge, but it's also so necessary uh, to really solve the problem for our students. Because if we keep on looking at our legacy in the universities, we are taking our institutions as a starting point, and we really should take the students as a starting point. And that's the same, of course, when it comes to train traveling. You can take your national railway as a starting point and say, well, we have it organized very well here, but that doesn't 
uh, take the international um, traveler into account. So I really think that we should change this perspective and that doesn't make it easier, uh, but that's really a change that we need to, to make. And I think when it comes to uh, keeping the space for innovation possible, I think that interoperability really makes um, that happen uh, because it opens also the market for startups. Um, because if you work more with microservices, it will be more easy to enter the educational market than it is right now. Um, so I really think that this idea of interoperability contributes to uh, the uh, space for innovation. Um, well, that are not really answers, but uh, uh, I'm uh, endorsing uh, what has been said. Yeah. And on a similar theme from me, I, the question, I suppose, is how we incentivize uh, our own institutions to make any necessary changes to work out what good practice we replicate from elsewhere, uh, where we hold on to differences or where we make changes. Um, Christine mentioned <clears throat> in her talk about uh, we can't necessarily have a solely top down approach with universities. We have a lot of autonomy as institutions. So how we encourage and pull people into um, examples of interoperability, such as through the alliances, but also if there is any way of exerting pushing pressure from uh, Géant or uh, organizations that have a bit more of a top down approach um, and are able to encourage uh, uh, pushes towards interoperability and compromise if it means that uh, it allows things to work far more efficiently. So it's a question more than anything. Thank you, Ben. Thank you all for your contribution. Uh, Marga, you Only thank you very much all the speakers because uh, one thing we have you have in common because you share the same enthusiasm, implication, and passion in your projects, and I think this is the the main part, the, the first part in order to collaborate and to to grow. And then thank you very much. Thank you. Can I? Can I maybe? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much uh, once again. To, or she wants to have some last word. Yeah, I'm. I'm really sorry. Uh, go ahead. No, no. Go sorry. Ahead, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I, I was not able to come to uh, Barcelona, but luckily uh, one of the members of the think tank that I mentioned is uh, in the room. It's Luis uh, Arino. Uh, so if you really want to talk uh, about this, these initiatives, uh, he is very welcome uh, um, to, to reach out to. So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Christine. Thank you very much, Christine. So um, as I was saying, now we will have uh, the coffee break. But right before the coffee break, we will have the family photo. So it will be done in the stairs that, where there is this uh, very beautiful Christmas tree. So please, uh, before going to the coffee for the coffee break, despite we all need the coffee, uh, please go to the stairs. We we'll make the first photo, and then we have the coffee break, and come back here at eleven. Thank you very much.
Hello. How are you? Hello. Let me introduce my team. Hello. 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 Okay, so we are about to begin. If you may, please take your seats and... So when my colleagues uh, give me the green light, is back. Uh, yep. Okay. So thank you very much uh, again for being here for the next session. Well, actually, a couple of sessions that will be guided by our rector's delegate for sustainability, Professor Teresa Sauras, and they will be based on one of the two of the core elements of our project on CharmU, as they are inclusion and diversity on one hand and inclusion and sustainability on the other hand. I remind our colleagues following the event through the online means that they have available the text to a speech uh, option on the Charm News YouTube channel. And without further hesitation, thus I provide uh, the word to our colleague uh, Teresa Sauras so that she can introduce the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ander. Good morning. So um, let me start by explaining a bit the aim of this, of this session. Then I will present the, the participants. So the main aim for the session is uh, to act as a catalyst for shared dialogue and experiences between stakeholders and participants regarding enablers and challenges to access and participation in higher education. Uh, from this main aim, we have three specific objectives for the session, is to showcase how CharmU has been transformed regarding inclusion and diversity, to showcase how unidiversity, I will present you afterwards, um, the participant of from unidiversity, how unidiversity is changing higher education regarding inclusion and diversity, and to create a space for a dialogue and share common enablers, challenges, and innovative solutions together to create a more inclusive and diverse European higher education area. So the participants today in this session are Agnes Sarolta, she is assistant professor from Ed Voss Loran University, is the leading is leading the World Packet 6 in the charm. Then we have Cathy Jerez Paredero from University of Barcelona, and she is in charge of the Unidiversity project. We have also Marcelo Scalisi, which is the director of the of UNIMED, the European Mediterranean Universities Union and Lina C. Pinsas, who will be the reporter um, of, the, of the session and is from Utrecht University. We have also, I would like also to, to mention that we have a speech to text service provision by Graviela and Cristina 
and Christina. So, um, please, uh, Agnes. Thank you so much and welcome. And uh, my name is Agnes Sharolta Fazekas. I am from the Utrecht Laurent University and I'm the work package leader on inclusion. And together with my colleagues today, we have a joint session. It is a unique session because we are bringing networks together to discuss how we can embrace inclusion and diversity in the European higher education area. And we will also give you space for dialogue, uh, we uh, planned a Q&A in the session. Of course, uh, uh, time is an access need, so we will adjust and redesign now in these minutes our session in order to respect the lunchtime and the network lunchtime later on. So what we will do now is that I will summarize and look back and take a uh, look forward uh, in terms of Charmi and how we discuss the inclusion and diversity in practice. And then I will give the floor to our deal colleagues and then Linas will uh, summarize the key points and uh, after I mean, uh, before uh, Lina's uh, key points, we will also give the space for uh, question and answers. So what we will do now is that I will time also, this is a cooking watch. <laughs> uh, we, will, we will make sure that our time is respected. So I will uh, summarize our uh, Charm EU um, uh, findings and results in the next 15 minutes. So I will just time up my time and let's let's start so uh yes the next yeah i'm just checking that is the yes is the perfect slide okay so uh how how uh, what does it mean mainstreaming and inclusion in diversity in charmy i would love to start then when uh, the charmy grant proposal has been written the writers and the, uh, the composers of this grant proposal had uh, an idea of inclusion and diversity. Of course, these are values in Europe and also on a global level. We also see in the SDGs, the no one left behind approach and also uh, SDG goal four on, on inclusive and, uh, and quality education. And uh, the question was for CharmEU that how to bring these wake concepts to the ground level. So let me start how we did it. So in the beginning of 2019, we had a separate work package where we had uh, deliveries uh, as a work package six on inclusion. But uh, when we had the very first meeting with our colleagues uh, in Dublin, uh, we realized that we really would like to have a meaningful uh, infusion of, of inclusion and diversity, like bringing into the different core and the different work packages uh, this approach. So from 2020, already from February, we made a different direction or, or changed the course of the direction and we started to collaborate with work packages. And how we did it, first of all, we created dialogue. We also shared some practical tools, checklists, and also inquired uh, moments uh, to, to meet up at uh, online meetings. Of course, the pandemic has been just started. So it was, it was the first aspect. And then, um, uh, uh, of course, uh, we knew that uh, the Charm EU Master Program is a key element of the, master, uh, of the Charm EU Initiative. So we also work together uh, with colleagues how to transform Charm EU's Master Program from the early on to make it as accessible and as inclusive as possible. I also put my heart in front of you and say that we have achieved a lot, but there is a lot to do in the future as well, but I'm very glad that uh, uh, we also exceeded the original um, uh, deliveries because we influenced the values, the educational uh, principles, the pedagogical guidelines. We also collaborated on the communication, on the government's model and so on. I will highlight in the next um, 
slides a few concrete examples. And then uh, when the master program was set up, uh, we also realized that we also need to serve uh, the students, the students' needs, and uh, we also discussed how we can do it. So, um, uh, Work Package 6 uh, uh, acted as an interim um, uh, equality or, uh, or inclusion office throughout the duration of the master program. And of course, we are creating uh, collaborations with um, local support units. Um, uh, and uh, we also supported uh, the students that their legal entitlement and their uh, and access and participation support needs are met to the greatest extent of possible. Of course, there is always room for improvement, um, but this is how we, we did it. And um, um, of course, we have been working with the uh, core core uh, key, key stakeholders. We also mentioned yesterday the knowledge creation teams. We also teamed up with, um, uh, with the academic staff to also share with them practical and, and tangible tools, how, how to make their uh, classroom environment more accessible. And as well, uh, we uh, provided quick wins uh, because we understand that it's, it's a, a lot of activities, a lot of uh, things to need to be considered, um, but quick wins where we can really make a difference in our teaching and learning environment. And of course, uh, from uh, 2020 and 21, uh, we also uh, uh, learned that uh, what are the processes that we need to streamline, what we need to find, find uh, like uh, uh, um, find to, to make it more fine and more more precise in the procedures, and we also addressed that uh, new activities to be taken. And I also many times mentioned with our uh, colleagues in, in the work package that uh, we have been also as a real-time icebreaker in the process of CHARM because, of course, uh, we ex experience new challenges on the go, so on the way, but uh, after this uh, pilot uh, program, we can also see that uh, how we can streamline all these lessons learned. So let's uh, move to the next element. Uh, which is transforming CHARM EU's organizations and the master program. So the word transforming and the word innovation is always a big, big uh, uh, word. Uh, and I would like to highlight that inclusion and also changing hearts and changing minds are, are takes time. So transformation also starts with dialogue, with, with time to sit down and, and share the different views, understand why is it important to bring uh, inclusion and diversity agenda on, on the top of the discussion. So transforming is really takes time, but uh, even during this short period of time, we had uh, numerous uh, occasions with colleagues. And what I can also say here uh, very from the bottom of my heart is that uh, I really experienced the openness uh, uh, from the Charm EU family or the Charm EU community to sit down and really uh, discuss and, and have a space for, for dialogue, even though that sometimes uh, uh, there are different views and different, uh, different opinions. So um, uh, this co-creation and co-dialogue has been uh, relevant. Of course, uh, we always needed to remind each other that, uh, that uh, where we can uh, create more improvement in terms of the different aspects. And uh, we also, we were very happy as well to bring in the students. Uh, we had been, an, we had an honor to work with the students in terms of uh, the day-to-day -day activities of the work package. So we had over the duration of the master, or sorry, the, the CHARMU program, uh, three students, uh, actually from Montpellier, from the University of Montpellier, who joined our uh, activities and joined our day-to-day uh, -day meetings and provided a very good feedback and afterwards that the master program has been um, 
up and running. We also have been working with the students as well. So, and then the next element is the governance model. Of course, this is one of the hearts of the program and uh, we also had uh, different uh, meetings and different discussions with the stakeholders and uh, um, of course during these discussions uh, we saw that or we discussed that okay uh, inclusion and diversity is not only a service uh, for the for the university community but we also need to take it as a strategic approach so my vision with my team was always to put as a, as a strategic approach and really uh, uh, implement it as our, as our uh, uh, values also in Europe and across the globe. Uh, in terms of the master program, now I will highlight key uh, concrete uh, aspects. In the master program, when we had the rules and regulation procedures, we also included inclusion aspects and measures. Uh, and afterwards, during the admission process, we also had two aims to break down the existing barriers uh, in, in, in the educational system to enable better access and also commit and, and implement also the, uh, uh, the social dimension of the Bologna process, which, you know, it started with the Leuven communique and, and then uh, many other communiques, communiques um, uh, to make sure that uh, higher education representing the uh, the diversity of the population. And of course, we were aware that uh, there will be students from all around the globe to, to join us in the master program. So we are also respecting the different equality uh, uh, legislations, not only in the European uh, higher education area and the European Union, but as much as possible in the global arena. And of course, the UN uh, uh, conventions, certain conventions are also providing a good tool. In terms of the finance, like money has been mentioned uh, in the, in in today and, and yesterday as well, we also realized that although uh, um, we have um, a, a very accessible and very open master program, we also can do proactive approaches with providing um, uh, an additional financial aids. We call it as a CHARM EU grant, and we also uh, brought this proposal to the Charmiu community how to make sure that uh, that uh, we provide better access. Of course, we realize that uh, uh, for non-EU students, it's also a, a big challenge to join this program, but I think so that uh, together with other alliances and also with Char, we can hopefully discuss it in a long run with the EU, how to make sure that, that there are financial in incentives in terms of that. I mentioned earlier uh, the support for the KCTs, the academic staff. We also provided inclusivity tips, simple things like how you make your PowerPoint more accessible, how what font size you use, what you can already uh, have a quick change in your in your. Um, a classroom environment or how you can take a five minute in the beginning of the class and proactively say that uh, we are committed to the values and we would like to create a welcoming environment in the classroom. So these proactive approaches are really uh, the practical size what inclusion and uh, inclusion by design means that we are reducing barriers from the beginning and not uh, rather than fixing the environment afterwards. And then um, we, uh, uh, yesterday and today, I'm very happy to see uh, many alliances in the room and also the 44 alliances. Many of the alliances uh, uh, work around inclusion, of course, in different measures and levels. So uh, uh, from the early on in 2020, in July, we had an, a wonderful invitation to the Utopia Alliance, where uh, we discussed digital inclusion, and it also reflects to the earlier session this morning how to 
consider uh, the digital agenda more inclusive and of course there are different aspects of the EU as well how to make uh, the accessibility agenda as a key element so what I always say is to to join forces and and work with different uh, DGs and the different organizational units of the EU and also the, the European university stakeholders. And then uh, uh, last year we had again a, um, a, a wonderful opportunity where we were approached by a civil society organization, COFASE Families, who is representing the diversity of families across Europe and uh, they approached us that they saw our activities online and also in our toolkits and they, uh, they uh, selected us as one of the uh, best practices in Europe and we are one of the uh, uh, university alliances who were at and our time is up, but I will, I will just finalize the last point. So basically we were very um, we were very happy uh, that that they included us in this report and uh, um, uh, this year before this uh, annual conference we had an inclusion conference in Budapest where we provided a space for uh, EU stakeholders, civil society organizations and the youth field to come up, uh, to, to join together and to create a joint discussion. So with this I would like to give the floor to uh, Kati and Marcello and I will also time it up for the 15 minutes. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes. Um, I'm Kati Jerez from the University of Barcelona Solidarity Foundation. It's my pleasure to be here with you and it's a pleasure because I am here between Marcello and Agnes and it's, sorry, it's uh, something not metaphorical because I am part of the World Package 6 of inclusiveness and a part of the uh, Unidiversity Project. So, um, yes, before starting with Marcello and a few words about inclusion, we would like to propose you to give your insights, your ideas about what inclusion and diversity is for you. So we have prepared this Mentimeter, so you can access Mentimeter, introduce the code. Let me go to the code. It's um, 16167023 and the question is what words come to your mind when the concept of inclusion of diversity in higher education institutions is mentioned. So you have three possible words to do. Let's go. Let's participate. You have your uh, your mobile in your hand, so introduce the uh, the words. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have the multimeter. We won't we won't see the multimeter here. But you please trust me because I will <laughs> tell you what are the words. And while you are doing this, I take advantage. I take the opportunity to announce that the workshop that we will do this afternoon about socially responsible universities for inclusive societies is one of the events of the final event of Unidiversity. There will be another event tomorrow. It's the, uh, the screening of the documentary we have been doing with two uh, university students of the University of Barcelona and uh, another student, Afghan student uh, of La Sapienza. And there will be a webinar on uh, on Friday, uh, the uh, the uh, slide with the uh, with the information is there. Teresa, Tere. Okay. Yes, I, but I don't know if you can give the information. The it's the other one. Exactly. This is the information. If you are interested in participating in the online webinar, you can register in the, in the link. So let's see what Mentimeter says. Um, well, okay, I will show you the screen, but you won't see anything. Trust me when I say that the first word is equality. 
that there are three more words important access, accessibility, respect, equality, openness, gender, yeah, empathy. So we have these concepts of equality and accessibility, then gender and respect. Acceptance is a key element as well, sensitiveness, fight inequalities, geographic diversity, chances, collaboration, add value, sense of belonging, economic disadvantages. We are, we are going to talk about everything. It's a shame that we cannot see it. Um, we are going to, to talk about this and Marcello will start Thank you very much, Cathy. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you, Teresa, for uh, obviously, first of all, thanks to all the Sharp community for inviting us and the University of Barcelona, of course, for the opportunity to, to join. I feel myself a little uncomfortable because it seems that I am a very old, win a very vintage uh, speaker without laptops in front of me, but I think that you understand the reason why they have laptops and not me. Um, let me say a few words, of course, first of all, about UNIMED, Mediterranean University Union, which is a network of Euro-Mediterranean universities. We have 150 universities from 24 countries, and we started in 1991. Uh, the word of inclusion in a network that have universities from both sides of the Mediterranean is part of our uh, daily life, of course. We work with the Arab world, and you know how sensitive this was, in particular, before COVID, when we were affected by several crises in the region. And still, we have several crises in the region. Once UNIMED started in 1991, the only big issues was the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now we still have the Israel-Palestinian conflict, and we have the Syrian situation, uh, the Lebanon crisis, uh, the Tunisian turmoil that is coming back probably, uh, the forgotten war in Yemen. Uh, the, I think that we can say also the crisis in Egypt and so on. The region is really unstable, unfortunately, and in some way we can say that the naval policy of the European Commission failed because the idea is to have uh, countries around the European Union, close to the European Union, that are in a safe, stable, uh, in a very good economic situation, and so on. But our work on inclusion started in particular during the Syrian crisis refugees, the crisis of refugees from Syria and some 10 years ago, 11 years ago, the European Commission launched us several programs to support refugees uh, in not only in higher education, but also in higher education. And we started with a couple of projects at that time, one in the Middle East, how to include refugees where refugees are in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Turkey, uh, also in Kurdistan region how to include refugees in higher education. We are discussing about numbers that are unbelievable. At that time, close to 2 million refugees in Jordan, in a country of 6 million people. 1 million refugees in Lebanon, a country of 12, 2 million and a half. But also we did a similar project with European universities at that time, how to include refugees also in European universities. And we discovered uh, with these two projects how important could be the role of universities to offer not only education and solution for employability and for inclusion in the society, but also to give hope. This is the most important signal that we discover at that time. But also we uh, understood another issue related to inclusion that once we talk about refugees in countries where there is also an important poor community, uh, we could also create some uh, unbalanced situation among refugees and the local poor community, the vulnerable community, 
for instance, in Lebanon, but also in Jordan. And this was creating at that time some, also some conflict in that situation, because there was a lot of support coming from international organizations, international institutions, to refugees, but not for the local pure community. And I think that university, again, can play an important role also to moderate this potential conflict, to try to include as much as possible the vulnerable community. But the most, another important element that we understood during these experiences, and we arrived thanks to this, to the Unidiversity Project, is that no one has the solution. We have to work in partnership with other important actors, local authorities, for sure, NGOs, international organization, for instance, UNHCR, IOM, and many others, Red Cross, and so on. Because only working together, we are able to offer uh, a strong and concrete contribution to such crisis that we are facing. Because once we talk about refugees, for instance, which is obviously part of our inclusion this discourse, we are not talking about other potential, we are talking also about us. What is happening now in Europe with the Ukrainian crisis uh, is a very important example of something that could happen also to us. Refugees is not a category that belong, uh, belong to someone that is so far from us. We are in a potential dimension where all of us could be aff affected by this, this project. And this is the reason why I think that it's mandatory for all of us to include the topic of inclusion in our, and also in the European University Alliances. And then through these experiences, we arrived to Unidiversity, which is a small European project with a few partners, obviously Unimed as coordinator, uh, sorry, Sapienza University as coordinator, this is very interesting to, to say because uh, we have we have to we have to think about this another story among Unimed and Sapiens uh, Sapiens University as coordinator, Unimed as partner, European University Association and, uh, as partner, and Fondación Solidaridad of the University of Barcelona plus other associated partners like uh, IOM and Campus France. In this case, we we moved to starting from migration and refugee issues to inclusion, generally speaking, and to try to address this topic in the governance of higher education uh, institutions and to, to try to push universities to include this uh, dimension in their own agenda. Because what I think is extremely important, we could have offices related to inclusion, experts, people appointed to work on it, but we need absolutely the commitment of the leadership. Otherwise, these issues remain something that we put on paper somewhere, we have in our policy chart and so on, but not concretely uh, influencing our work, our community, and also our local and, and regional community. Uh, and this is the reason why I think that what we are doing in the alliances, for me, is extremely important. Because the European University Alliances are an important experience. Obviously, you are still working on it. And, but I think that there are two points missing in my, in my perspective. I was Monday in Brussels discussing in a, a European University Association webinar meeting on this, on the internationalization of the alliances. Where is internationalization? And I mean outside Europe, the trances, and the other point, where is inclusion of diversity in, in the alliances? Because the alliances express the European values that at the moment are under attack, but this is another story. Uh, express the European values. And European values, differently than single member states' values, are related to human rights, inclusion, um, topic of inclusion, migrants, diversity of religion, and many other and many other issues, refugees, 
should be, should be the priority of the alliances. In this perspective, also to open the door of alliances to uh, internationalization, because otherwise we risk that we promote the European dimension as a fantastic gold model and we maintain the other outside of this. We need to include also our neighborhood, in particular third countries, poor countries, to try to imagine that, for instance, the Erasmus program should be more open than is actually, and I'm going to finish, uh, and to attract again our neighbor to work with us because we have common problems to solve. The Mediterranean problems that we are facing are not related to southern Mediterranean countries. The crisis in Libya, for instance, is not something that belongs to them, belong to us, not only for our responsibility for the past, but for our future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now we have uh, exactly 18 minutes to go. Uh, in these 18 minutes, what we would like to do is to open the floor to the audience. What I would suggest that around uh, uh, seven to eight minutes, uh, we give the floor to the audience. And after, I will give the floor to Linas to uh, uh, summarize the key points. So if I can ask, yes, we have on the screen some conversation starters, if the audience is, uh, uh, has no questions, but we really hope that you have some questions to ask. Um, so let's see first if we have uh, questions from the audience and if we have any help from with microphones. Yes, uh, please end the microphone. Thank you very much. On? Yeah, thank you very much. I think this is an extremely important, uh, say, uh, topic. And I want to add something and uh, perspective. So uh, from the perspective of open science and public engagement and stakeholder engagement, uh, the idea is to set the agenda with people from outside academia. Very much, of course, in vain is what people have been saying. And I think in, from that perspective, we also need EDI very much because I'm from the north of Holland, from Friesland. Uh, and for me, Ethiopia was a really a very different country, very different, I can tell you embarrassingly different from my perspective when I decided to do HIV AIDS research there. So it is very important to bring people in, in the academia who come from these regions, who come from other, say, uh, ethnic groups, but also other economic and social groups. Very, very important because they can help us to do our work much better. And of course, uh, as, a, as, a, as a byproduct, we are very EDI also with respect to our staff. But for, I think that this is... This is uh, this is an interdependency which cannot be, say, uh, emphasized enough. And therefore, I do it today. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you so much for your intervention. Uh, Yes, I give the floor to Kati. Just one one thing, um, uh, definitely, uh, which also influences our work in Charm EU, uh, which I haven't um, emphasized enough this, uh, uh, this this afternoon now, is that we work under a holistic, intersectional, and human rights-based approach to inclusion and diversity. And of course, when we were uh, thinking about stakeholders and the capstone phase and all the different aspects. We also uh, were discussing how to bring in business and society uh, and uh, we will keep keep on those discussions and I give the floor to Kati. Thank you very much. Um, following your idea, I think it's very important to go to the places but also to bring the places to our houses in terms, not only in terms of the people can come in terms of mobility, also in terms of knowledge, the recognition of the other people's knowledge is not only the uh, traditional Western knowledge. There are more types of word, no, knowledges, more types of wisdoms that we can introduce. It's very enriched and it's part of this inclusion of diversity. It's, that's only. Exactly. And introducing 
and introducing as well these knowledges. And joining UNIMED, why not? Thank you. Any further questions from the audience? No? Yes? Yes, we have over there. Yes? Ah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to add on that for um, in terms of transdisciplinarity. So as part of Torch, we did a research on public engagement. And there we also found that one of the gaps are the sort of unusual suspects in public engagement. So there's often structures, policies, and people are really active in public engagement, but it's often like the bigger companies or the sort of people who are already interested in science. So um, also a question to you, how do you think you can we can um, engage also the unusual suspects or the ones who are most left behind and who are further away from the universities? Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, definitely to find the gems in the in the in the pool of experts and pool of stakeholders. Uh, what we did uh, is uh, that uh, also brings the wealth of knowledge and the wealth of expertise that throughout our uh, work package six and also wonderful colleagues working in the uh, universities in the charming alliance we have those networks. So these are in with us at the moment. We just need to uh, channel those networks and stakeholders into the the overall discussions and, and dialogues and engagement. And it's true that uh, still uh, uh, big stakeholders in business and society are are you know we need to find those specific uh, uh, groups but i'm very happy that uh, we have also a network uh, on a global level and also on a european level to really give an email or give a phone call to to those stakeholders and what i can also add here is that the lived experiences of individuals and also leaders like leaders who who are running big businesses big companies and who are also have the lived experience to share because this is also a different type of leadership and we also hope that in charmi and in the european higher education area we will have a more diverse and more inclusive leadership and it takes a lot of time and baby steps any comments from my colleagues yeah um we haven't we have had a very poor time management and i haven't been i haven't had the opportunity of introducing the different outputs of unit papers one of them in the atlas this question you have highlighted is one of the questions that are there, the need to collaborate, the need to spread this collaboration and cooperation with other um, institutions, agents, in terms of this social transformation. And my controversial question for you is, do you understand this um, inclusion for diversity as part of this transformation of society, as part of looking for social justice because it's not about introduce non-traditional or uh, underrepresented groups it's about change change our societies changing our institutions so this is my question for you thank you so much and um, looking at the audience and also looking at our time, I think so I will give the floor to Linas to summarize the key points and also, also bring your, your own perspectives as you are also a member of the Work Package 6 from Utrecht. Thank you very much, Agnes. Thank you very much, panel. Uh, good uh, afternoon. Is, yeah, is, yeah, is yes, it works. I will try to do my best job to summarize the discussion and presentations that have just been given and taking place. So the objectives of this session were to showcase uh, what CHIM has done in terms of transforming diversity and inclusion within the project, uh, to showcase how unit diversity is changing higher education regarding diversity and inclusion, and as well to create a safe space and dialogue on common enablers and challenges for creating 
common solutions uh, for inclusive and diverse European higher education area. Uh, in terms of the main findings, uh, TrimeU has done a lot and has done even uh, more than what it had planned initially uh, at the setup of the project. Uh, a lot of attention uh, was uh, focusing on diversity and inclusion within the work package six. A lot of cooperation has taken place across different work packages. A variety of stakeholders were engaged, including students uh, from the very beginning uh, of the program to make sure the um, admission is inclusive and accessible as, as much as possible, that the learning materials are also inclusive, um, and that there are tangible practical tools available for teachers and tutors to use in the classroom environment. Um, in terms of the master program, um, the, the Work Packet 6 has acted as an interim EDI office, uh, collaborating with different support units uh, regarding the items such as legal entitlement, entitlement and the educational needs to be able to study uh, effectively within the master program. Um, from 2020 and 2021, uh, there, was, um, uh, there was focus on how to streamline uh, processes and how to redefine procedures so that they are more effective towards students, new activities that are proposed, and this uh, acted to improve the quality um, of the teaching um, transforming TramiU as an organization as well, uh, this is something that is worthwhile mentioning. Inclusion takes time, it needs time, you need to invest in it, and that has also been uh, discussed. Um, there has been uh, a lot of openness uh, from TramiU community towards diversity and inclusion items, despite different uh, views and opinions present. Uh, there has been uh, ample uh, co-creation and co-dialogue on different levels to enable um, inclusivity and diversity within the program. Uh, in terms of governance model, Work Package 6 members have also been involved, involved in developing and redesigning the uh, governance model for the CharmU program. Um, and this has been central and uh, towards that. Um, in terms of collaboration with other partners and alliances, CharmU is not uh, acting in a vacuum. Other alliances within Europe and also outside of Europe have been uh, involved in discussions and deliberations. Um, some of the examples mentioned include the Utopia Alliance, uh, cooperation on digital inclusion, how to make accessibility uh, work uh, around inclusion on different levels. Um, also um, cooperating with COFAS, COFACE Europe, a civil society organization um, which uh, recognized TRIMEU's work on diversity and inclusion, uh, calling it uh, as one of the best practices in Europe in terms of diversity and inclusion. Uh, one of the last events that was organized by uh, Work Packet 6 and the larger team was the inclusion conference, the TRIMEU inclusion conference in Budapest last September providing a safe space for civil society organizations and our alliance partners to discuss diverse inclusion in practice at our institutions and beyond. Um, looking further, uh, regarding UNIMED, uh, there was information provided on, the, on, on this alliance uh, consisting of 150 different universities from 24 countries from around the world, uh, organization set up in 1991 uh, at the outset of different uh, political crises in the region, unstable region. Um, work uh, has moved, not just from focusing on refugees, but also on the broader issues of diversity and inclusion and what member states can do, especially what is the role of universities in these matters, how can they act as a mediator, uh, between the local populations that are poor and vulner vulnerable and also refugees uh, settling in the countries affected by crisis. Um, what is important to mention is that refugees are not far away from us. The current example of Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, shows that uh, it can be very close to us and it's also part of our problem. We have to provide also solutions and in our input and universities could also play a critical role in that in accommodating the needs and bringing a hope to the refugees for the brighter future. Um, some, something look, looking forward in terms of European alliances is at, at this point, uh, inclusion of diversity in the alliances is something that could even more be strengthened. Um, there is a attack on European values in general um, there, is, there should be more collaboration, there should be a priority on focusing on European values 
and using this open to open doors for other alliances and to spreading internationalization of these alliances by including also third countries from outside the EU um, to make sure that our neighbors are included in the process towards inclusion and diversity uh, to solve common problems, the problems that belong to both parties actually. Um, in terms of the audience, there were some questions uh, raised on the engagement from different parties. There has been a recognition that taking the EDI perspective um, in matters is very important, uh, including partners from outside the, our, our alliances, the usual suspects, um, including more uh, less represented groups and um, populations in our work, in our discussions, including the business partners and companies uh, figure leaders in, the, in this work uh, and making sure that we also consult them and involve in these processes, uh, channeling our experiences and skills. Um, CharmiU at the present has a global network and a European um, network of different partners on different levels and different stakeholders. Of course, there is a room for improvement and we're working towards including these parties in our daily processes and redefining our strategies as we move on. Um, I think that would be it for now. Thank you. If I miss something, please feel free to fill up. Thank you so much. Ah, thank you so much. And I also turn to you to also to to share with your own perspectives because Lina has joined a little bit later, so I'm also interested about your your viewpoint. Yes, there are. Thank you, Agnes. There are a lot of points uh, discussed here today uh, in the room, and there are a lot of issues that are very important. Um, I joined TrimeU in February this year. Uh, the really nice, diverse team composed of different colleagues, very uh, spirited and very committed and willing to make a difference in the world. So I'm really proud and very happy to be able to be part of this team. Um, I think inclusion and diversity starts with us. Um, it's also who we surround ourselves with. Uh, how we involve ourselves uh, on a professional level, on a personal level, in matters that affect uh, societies across the world. We can all make, I think, a difference. Um, again, it starts with us. Uh, it's the attitude, it's the spirit, it's the can-do attitude that matters. Uh, there are all kinds of administrative, uh, bureaucratic barriers that you come across in daily work, but I think um, if you have the idea in mind and you strongly believe in it, I think that can definitely help and make a difference uh, in the work that you do and also maybe inspire others uh, that can make a difference in the work that you do every day. So on that note, um, I would like to wish uh, everyone uh, a lot of enthusiasm, inspiration and uh, to continue the good work that we have been doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would like to wrap up um, uh, the, um, the session today and the look forward part is that as it's on the screen uh, that we also need to be uh, open for change, as Kati was saying, and also reflect on our structures in ourselves. So it's also an organizational transformation, but also on a personal level. And also uh, understand that uh, we need to collaborate as co-creation, collaboration, co-design uh, uh, is, is crucial uh, because if we don't uh, if we don't include uh, these aspects that we, we lose, lose out on so much. And uh, what I can also say is that we keep, keep the hard work uh, in the next um, term. We also have a lot of vision and mission to, to change uh, in charm. And I'm very delighted to see the baby steps. And those baby steps become a big, big, uh, big step. So it was really good to see. And I really hope that uh, we will also inspire other alliances to have a, a very tangible uh, actions in terms of uh, uh, those uh, values and also the daily practices. So bring from, from, from the very vague concept uh, inclusion and diversity to the ground level and also include uh, all kinds of people and uh, uh, people from all walks of life um, because um, we will also create a change and create innovation when, when we join together. So with this, I would like to also officially thank my work package team members throughout this uh, uh, three, four years and also the Charmi community and also those colleagues 
who have been working behind the scenes and uh, tirelessly were working. I also officially thank the speech-to-text service providers who are behind the screen, but they are providing greater access. These are, again, small things, but we also creating more access within these um, educational and also societal spaces. So with this, we would like to thank you and uh, I, Im uh, and, um, I invite everyone to keep, keep working on this journey of inclusion. Thank you. Don't miss the workshop we are going to do at 2.15. We are going to, to, to work on the strategical framework, so it's important to, to be there and move forward in this topic with Chibis and Charmi representatives. Thank you.
Hello. Hello again, everybody. Let's go to start the last session before lunch. Um, hello, good morning, everyone. So this is the last session before lunch. We have one hour session and the, the idea of this session uh, is the, the principles of the new European Bauhaus and the European University University's values towards a sustainable and inclusive future. So this is a hybrid session and we have a very diverse panel that I will present you in a few minutes. But in this session, the idea is to debate whether it's possible to marry or to consign no? sustainability and inclusion as is articulated in the UN 2030 agenda together with the principles of the new European Bauhaus and with our missions in the university, that it's education, research, and innovation. And how can we promote those, those uh, principles in a more broadly way to, to translate to society and taking into consideration the, the context of the current reality we have now and also has been stated by Marcelo and others in the previous session. No? So before starting presenting the panels, I would like to introduce you. Um, we have um, a, a short introduction by Marcos Ross Sempere. He's a member of the European Parliament and he is not here today because there is a session in Strasbourg. So he will be, he recorded a, um, a video no, to, to be here with us somehow. So please, if you, want, if you want, okay. Good afternoon to everyone, and thanks for coming to this session. I regret to not being able to be here with you today in Barcelona, but I am very sure that the entire term EU annual conference will be a success. We are here today to talk about the new European Bauhaus principles and the relation with the European University values. For me, it is very clear. Both initiatives are united by the innovative spirit and the strength of the university community to create new ideas and improve the quality of our lives. But even though you are already working on it in your master's program, someone could ask me, what is the new European Bauhaus? What is the aim of this initiative? My answer is obvious. Like the historical Bauhaus, it is about improving people's lives. It is about putting culture, architecture, design, and urban planning at the service of the society. For years, we have been spending millions of euros on renovating buildings to make them less polluting. But from a democratic point of view, it is ethical to invest large amounts of public money just to improve the energy efficiency of buildings and cities without also improving the lives of citizens who live in them? We need a paradigm shift. With the same investment, perhaps for a little more, we can use these funds to improve our quality of life by transforming homes, neighborhoods and cities to suit our needs. The new European Bauhaus is this paradise safe, an initiative that invites us to think about how we inhabit our built spaces and comes at a key moment for the European Union. In the legislature of the Green Deal, with the recovery funds and with the renovation ways of buildings. The new European Bauhaus comes to adapt our homes, our neighborhoods and our cities to these changes through energy efficiency, beauty, understood as comfort, as adaptability of spaces to the use, 
And finally, in closing, by allocating funds to the people who need it most. Energy efficiency, yes, but also beauty and social engagement. With the new European Bauhaus, it is the first time that architecture, urbanism, design and culture are put together at the center of the European Union's policies. Only in this way, we can achieve a high quality built environment which benefits people and the environment. The original Bauhaus movement came to democratize our homes, our objects to make them more comfortable, easier to produce, more affordable. A hundred years have passed and the ways of living have changed much more than the space built. But the time has come. The democratizing spirit of the original Bauhaus has been rekindled in the European Union. It is time to transform buildings, neighborhoods and cities to improve the lives of all, especially for those who need it most. Thank you very much for attending this session and I wish you an excellent conference. Greetings from Strasbourg. So after this warm introduction by Marcos, let me introduce you, our, our panelists, uh, a very diverse uh, group of, of people. Uh, the idea for this, for this session is to have a dialogue uh, among all the, all the participants. So I, I introduce you Frank Midema, he's from Utrecht University and is part of the Charm U. From another uh, European alliance, we have uh, Pedro Matias. He's from the Filmeu Alliance. Uh, this is um, a European university focused on media, um, media arts and film. So we have, we go border. We have um, Ana Ramos, which is the director of the Fundación Mies van der, van der Roy. sorry. We have uh, Julian Miralles, which is advisor on science at universi and university policy at Barcelona City Council, and Joanna Post, team lead on the adaptation division in the United Nations Climate Change. So thank you to all of you for being here and Uh, if you if you want, we can start. Uh, I can have a first question, maybe for Frank from the Charm. So, if um, one of the mission of of the Charm view is to reconciling humanity with the planet, no, and that means that this this is about bringing community to help drive implementation of the EGDs. So, but of course, the EGDs are not um, silent, are, um, have a great connectivity and are very transversal, no? So, um, that means that uh, all the EGDs have um, intended and unintended consequences from actions. What aspects of the term EU education will it keep students to understand this connectivity and promote a holistic understanding, ensuring that sustainability solutions must be inclusive, but that also we need to live in an aesthetical, um, pleasing surrounding, surroundings? No, how we can combine educating students in sustainability, but also in aesthetics and beauty. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm totally out of my comfort zone here. Can you see? Um, because I'm a chemist, a biochemist. I was an immunologist, infectious disease specialist. And then, of course, discussing how art and architecture uh, and of course, I'm familiar with Bauhaus in the, 100 years ago by visiting Berlin and going to these places. 
and even recently. And so for me, this is really um, being an old, old scientist, let me be honest with you. Uh, this is something that has not come up in my career very much. I'm really, my, my first name is Frank, so let's be frank. Eh? Uh, and so this is really new for us and for, for me. For you not, of course, you, you're, you're totally different people. But um, for, for somebody who, who was uh, uh, the dean of a medical center, etc., etc. of course, there was art in, our, in, the, in the corridors, but that was just in the corridors. Eh? And uh, so you have to re realize this is really something. Uh, and, uh, and of course, when I was invited to, 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 to be in the, in the panel, uh, I was like, ooh, this is really... Uh, but of course, I love it. Huh? Let, let's be clear. This is something that really has to be done. And of course, I can give the defense. Charmy Yu is bringing in the master totally different aspects of humanity, social sciences, arts even. Uh, the, and, and there are totally different aspects in the course, which of course is also biomedical, um, is also uh, engineering and, and technocratic. So you have here, a, 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 you have the, the technocrats that we are training, that we now we show them, but then I have good news for you. Because uh, not only my kids, which are in the early 30s, but I think many, many young people who are now entering academia, they, they find this more easy, that this is not, this is in their com comfort zone more of the time. We see that also the students in Charm U Master, they are different students, I always say. I, Marianne Kaveigers is there. Yesterday we said, these are different students. They, that's, it's fun. Because they are not, say, uh, disciplined. They, 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 they want to look across the disciplines, exactly what you have been desc describing in your, say, introduction. They, they want to cross borders. And also, and for them, art, uh, uh, architecture, is not, it's just... In, the, in their own life. And, and, uh, and of course, we are disciplined in the neoliberal, the early uh, phases of my career. Frank, it's not about art, it's about, say, technology, making a product, etc. And, and the, the youngsters, I, I think they love it. And we see that also in the course. There are different people coming to the course, to the master, that bring these, 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 these broader transdisciplinary uh, aspects. And we cater to them. That means we serve them with, in the master with that type of approaches, capstones, uh, and my introduction, my, my intervention in the previous session was exactly that. Now we have to bring the people in from outside, and we have to bring our students to outside, etc. So uh, I'm even without my comfort zone as an old, say, chemist and an old dean. I think this is this is really wonderful. And uh, of course, my first uh, and then I stop. Uh, my first uh, impression and my first thoughts went back to the original Bauhaus, but was also being uh, say uh, and also the. the the, 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 the person from the department was, was referring to those because that, that has been, a, uh, for most of the people, has had a very strong effect in the early years when I was very young. It, uh, and, and of course, and I, yesterday evening, I was, of course, uh, nervous and I was re re looking at my, on my laptop and I saw the, the fantastic architectural design of the new building in Sevilla, Seville. And uh, that is, of course, something like, yeah, wow. And if, if researchers can work there, then it, that will be, say, for them, uh, an, an inspiration already by, by parking your car or putting your bicycle there, going in that in such a beautiful building. My God, wonderful. So I stop here. This is what we do in Charm. Of course, but we need more and we need this connection with the new Bauhaus. I stop here. Thank you very much, Frank cross borders and more creativity. So now, um, uh, Pedro Matias from Filmeu. I have also a question from you, and maybe if you want, then we can show the, the two slides you have. So uh, central to the ethos of uh, Filmeu is that cinema and media arts lie at the center of social transformation and economic growth. So the Filmeu Alliance will educate for uh, will educate, but those educated through that alliance, which also in turn have the power to challenge others to think. No, you are mm, training the trainers. Have you included aspects of thinking around the principles of the new European Bauhaus in what the alliance does? The, all this uh, sustainability, inclusion, and aesthetics. Um, do you agree with that uh, principles also? Well, uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to make a disclaimer. 
So me, as Frank, I'm also uh, very uncomfortable here, and I explain why. Because I am a mathematician who works in an alliance focused in film and media arts, and who was invited to a conference to talk about sustainability, inclusion, and aesthetics. So I'll do my best. And I'll start by the aesthetics part, which I think is uh, a very important topic in mathematics. In mathematics, we have a guiding principle. So in mathematics, there's no place for ugly mathematics. And the principle that we have in, in, in this area, I think we should have also in life. And uh, answering the questions uh, about FilmEU, in FilmEU is also uh, an alliance. Let me uh, tell a few words about the alliance. It's a very short alliance with only uh, four institutions. So Lusofna University in Portugal, Lucas School of Arts, uh, in Belgium, uh, Baltic Film and Media Arts School in Tallinn, and um, the last one, Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Dublin. And we are in an enlargement process now in the, in the second phase with four new institutions, uh, one from Bulgaria, another from Slovakia, another one from uh, Lithuania, and the last one from Denmark. Yeah. So, uh, in FilmEU, we are uh, very, uh, uh, well, the, the topics that, uh, the pillars that uh, surround the new European Bauhaus are very important in FilmEU. And I will start by sustainability and give you two examples that we have, uh, two very practical examples that we have implemented in the last, in the last uh, year. The first one is this, is this micro-credential that started uh, last November about sustainable management and audiovisual production. Uh, so this is an area that people that works on film is very concerned and is related with green shooting. So the second example, uh, it's, the, it's about the, our summit. So every year, we organize uh, uh, a summit where we, we meet not only people from FilmEU, but also uh, uh, external stakeholders. And the last summit uh, took place in Dublin. As you can see, uh, it's a very uh, green slide, like my shirt. So I, I, <laughs> I decided to come here with the right dressing. And, uh, and this summit, uh, uh, every summit has a thematic. And uh, the thematic about this summit was, as you can see, um, environmental sustainability in film education and the wider film and media arts industry. So in this summit, we invited, uh, uh, as I said, external stakeholders. We gave some uh, lectures and talks about, uh, about uh, this environmental sustainability inside film, which for me, it was a surprise also. I, I noticed that they are even using uh, CO2 um, uh, counters so that can, they can measure the, the, um, the, the numbers that they are uh, producing when they move from one place to another. So they try to, to have not so much impact on the environment when they are uh, producing a, a film, for instance. So. Uh, these are two very practical examples, and I will close my first, uh, my first intervention, saying that in the, the programs that we are designing inside FilmEU, we, we are also taking into account this, uh, this, um, the practices of green and sustainable production in, in all, all the pilots that the students have been uh, involved, and also in our pilot research uh, projects. Thank you very much, Pedro. Interesting to account for the footprint, no, for the footprint of the films. So let's move to to from this scientist in the university wall to to the to Ana Ramos, to the director of the Fundación Mies van der Rohe. And I would like to to ask you because the the, the original Bauhaus was a center on architecture 
uh, was the new European Bauhaus is more is, uh, is, is seen as a key driver on the EU, EU, EU European <laughs> Union Green Deal, and is, is therefore broader and very much uh, connecting to our living spaces and our experiences. No, all of which will require a multi-sectoral and uh, transdisciplinary approach, probably. So citizen engagement is important in, in that regard, no? in this um, more broad uh, approach. How does your foundation view the principles of the Union European Bauhaus and what role do you think such foundation can play in discussing and debating the practicality of the principles of this um, with different sectors, like in our universities? Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I am an architect uh, uh, trained in, in, in Barcelona. That means that I am an architect with uh, engineering skills, which is how the profession of architects is performed in this country differently to others. Um, so we have this background on beauty, culture, aesthetics, philosophy, but then in calculation, chemistry, mathematics, and, um, and it's very pleasant to me to be here in this beautiful university, which is not my alma mater, uh, but it's the most beautiful one in the city, of course. Um, Fundación Mies van der Rohe is a um, cultural institution uh, who uh, is... Um, our main goal is to share the beauty of the Mies van der Rohe Pavilion here in Barcelona, which is a reconstruction of the 1929 German Pavilion in the Barcelona International Fair, designed by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and his partner, and um, too often forgotten, Lili Reich, Miss Lili Reich. And they were both uh, designing that exceptional building who was demolished and then uh, reconstructed in the 80s. So we can still learn from it and enjoy it. And it's one of the most beautiful places on earth, I would say. And it's one of the changing points of 1920s revolution in architecture and design. The Bauhaus School was not only focused on architecture, but overall in design. They were trying to design for the new humanity that was born after the technical revolutions and after all the diseases and wars that convey uh, and struggled Europe in that time. Um, so we are now facing a similar revolution, which is uh, how to overcome the need of extreme sustainability uh, for ourselves, for the planet, for the future generations. And this revolution could be led from art, from design, and from architecture. Um, we, when, we when we built a building, and I'm going... There, we could put the focus on anything. We could put the focus on this glass, or on this microphone, or in the ugly screen you are seeing there, which could be probably much better, or on your phone design, or other things. It's only that we have to pay attention to the whole process. From the very beginning, to all the parts, all the different disciplines that took in there, to the production of the materials, to the production of the objects, to the design, to how comfortable is it this chair I'm sitting in. It's, it's awfully uncomfortable. You could not imagine. It's not made for my size. It's not... And I don't know about your chairs, but everything we do every day, or this table, look at this table. Is this a round table that we are sitting here? It should be kind of easier to remove this table there so we could kind of see each other on the face and have a good conversation. So our work when we foster architecture and design culture is just to make you guys aware of the spaces where you are spending your whole life since you're born until you die, and since you wake up until you go to sleep. And there's always a, chain, a chance for improvement. And that's kind of how we could 
bridge together all the disciplines. So that's uh, kind of my introduction to this. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Anna. And now I have a question for, for Julia Miralles from the City Council, Barcelona City Council, no? So because our, our cities are the core of achieving climate neutrality, and Barcelona is one of the 100 cities selected to try to transition being a climate neutral and a smart city by 2030. Uh, very ambitious objective, no? And what role do you, do you see universities like uh, and, this, and the European universities such as CHARM can play in working with cities to help this transition for this neutrality in carbon in that, that time, no? Maybe, I don't know, experimentation, innovation, or I don't know what you're feeling or what's your opinion from the, from the city, city council. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for the invitation. I think also it's very interesting to have this so transdisciplinary panel. No? So I think that you're really focusing on this. That is one of the objectives of the alliances and also of the new European Bauhaus. I would say that, first of all, um, for this objective of climate neutral cities, that, as you said, is quite ambitious, but is also absolutely needed, um, universities can play a central role on connecting to society. So first of all, I will explain different ways uh, on how universities can connect to society and give relevant improvements and knowledge to society in general in relation to climate change and climate neutral cities. Um, but I would also would like to begin saying that universities per se are very diverse communities. So within universities, we have students we have um, lecturing people, we have professors, we have researchers, and we have also a lot of administrative people that sometimes is not considered as part of the universities. But universities are not only about professors that maybe are um, the general idea society have about these, uh, these institutions. So within universities, we have a broad range of society that um, makes universities per se a central stakeholder on any societal change, I would say. But then uh, three specific, um, let's say, actions that universities play and that can have a relevant role on any societal change, but especially on this climate uh, neutral objective that is currently uh, central for all of us. So first, uh, the idea of transdisciplinarity. Uh, universities are, I would say, a point of encounter of a lot of these um, ideas present in the new European Bauhaus or in the universities' alliances. They are a link between knowledge, culture, science, technology, so this makes them also a very interesting actor. Then universities are also research centers, so they are the, you know that we have also other research centers in Spain, but mostly um, around more than half of the research in the country is done in universities. So research is done in universities and the scientific advising that cities, for example, need for these climate neutral objectives, of course, should come also from universities. They are also um, a central element of transfer of knowledge. So we have here young people studying on their first stage of professional or research formation and universities are so uh, this way of spreading knowledge and spreading not only knowledge, but also the consciousness of people around the need of uh, struggling against climate change and for more sustainable societies. And finally, I would say, and maybe connecting more with this idea of say, universities are already connected with a broad range of different um, actors in society, these students, these professors, but also administrative people. A lot of different people works and stays a lot of hours a day in the university, but also they can make an effort to connect more with society. And I think the university's alliances are doing this effort, and I think this is a big a goal that these alliances are achieving. And for example, universities like UBE, where we are now, but I'm sure also a lot of universities, I don't know much, of the alliances, 
are participating a lot on uh, dissemination projects, participatory approaches to science. And for example, with the City Council, we have now been collaborating on the new citizen science project of the City Council with some researchers of the university. And also we would like to keep working with the students, with PhD students, so with a broader range of actors in universities. And these projects of citizen science, I think, can be crucial also to link climate change needs uh, with scientific knowledge and with the consciousness of society around these needs. So I would uh, stop here by now. Thank you very much. Uh, um, sorry, Joanna, Julia. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, we are part of the city <laughs> and the citizens of the city are part of the university. So we have to work together, no? Um, and finally, a question for, for Joanna Post from the um, United Nations Climate Change. So, uh, if we are we are moving to this uh, part of the of the climate change, while well, we are making progress towards uh, the SGDs, uh, they are unlikely to be. Uh, fully achieved by 2030 this, this is also no this is one of the of the issues with the with this uh, un agenda so are, are we likely to see a reframing of of then of this SGDs or so, if so do you think the principles of the new european bauhaus could be more strongly incorporated into, into the EGDs, although I think more or less there are, there are because there are also um, some EGDs uh, dedicated to cities and, of course, to, to architecture and, and design. So, thank you, uh, Joanna. Um, thanks very much for the question, and uh, I have to be one of those people that's completely out of their comfort zone right here. So, uh, so um, I am of course uh, work at the UN uh, at the Climate Change Center um, Secretariat, and we're we're supporters or catalysts of the Paris Agreement. Um, I work widely with colleagues across the UN. Uh, I cannot say what the decisions would be about the SDGs in 2030. Uh, but we actually um, also think much more widely than that because we are sort of catalyzing the Paris Agreement, which has uh, goals towards 2050, actually, which is the net zero um, goals of the Paris Agreement and the uh, resilience and the need to limit uh, temperatures well below two, but also to build resilience and sustainability within that context. So. There is SDG 13, of course, on climate change, but we also are thinking up to and beyond uh, 2030. But of course, with the need to immediately uh, work towards uh, sustainability now, transformation to a, to a different way of thinking and learning now to, uh, to, to move society in, in the right direction. So um, we are... Uh, with my role at the, at the Climate Change Secretariat, uh, I work in the Adaptation Division. We're committed to closing knowledge gaps, scaling up and transforming climate adaptation action in countries, particularly in least developed countries and small island states, and to build climate change resilience. And, and we're also looking at bringing in, uh, you know, um, coordinating with knowledge holders to bring that information into the decision making process. And I think one of the things we've heard in the last couple of days is, is uh, with, with the Charm EU project is this importance of thinking differently to transform how we do things previously to, to how we can, can move forward in a, in a different way. And I think that's a really important part of the conversations as we think about you know, getting to 2030, thinking about how we, we work together with communities of practice uh, both within universities and on the ground um, to, to really try and find transformative ways of, of moving forward to address the, the challenges in society. And, and we are very much trying to do that from, from our perspective at the Climate Change Secretariat and, and bringing convener um, these, these uh, knowledge uh, and knowledge expertise and, and bringing people together from a range of backgrounds to really build up these bottom up opportunities. Um, so coming back to your question, um, I think the, the, the UN certainly is, is, is pushing for the, um, transformation for sustainability 
uh, with the SDGs, we know they won't they won't be achieved by 2030, um, and there is still a lot of work to be done. Um, bringing in the concepts of the Bauhaus, uh, I think a lot of them are already there, uh, but we really need to think about it more in a context of um, how do we implement these ideas that we have within the SDGs and work together in in, uh, in, in moving us to this sort of transformative way forward. Thank you, thank you very much. Mm. Joanna, I don't know if someone in the audience want to, to make a question for the, for the participants, maybe. So the, otherwise, I, I would like to, to ask um, a question that, uh, do you want, sorry, Frank, are you going to? Sorry. I have a question, I have a question. <laughs> Um, it happens, Bauhaus is coming from Germany, right? So it happens, ladies and gentlemen, that we have two new, say, ads to our program from Würzburg and from uh, Hochschule Ruhr West, and that's in Germany. So I would like to ha invite my colleagues here, and they are here both, and they are looking at me now, eye contact. So are we now totally, say, uh, Begeistered by Bauhaus, and is this totally irrelevant? And do you think, my God, what are these people talking about? Uh, or do you think, ah, finally, I'm not going to fill in? So, so please, can I invite you to comment? It's coming from Germany, ladies and gentlemen. It's coming from Germany. I don't think that's quite fair. <laughs> I think um, uh, what, what I find really interesting is um, that, I mean, it's Mies van der Rohe comes from Germany, I agree. Mies van der Rohe Foundation is here in, in Barcelona. Um, <clears throat> so it's an international, it's a human issue, right? It's not a German issue. A German had a, there's a history uh, of Bauhaus in Germany. But what I found really interesting was Anna Ramos's points at how little uh, the human needs are still um, taken into account, especially when you know when education buildings are being built. Um, you know, our university is very young, 13 years old. Our buildings are less than 10 years old, and you have no idea how disastrous it feels if you think you have a comfortable learning environment. You know, they were, of course, planned 15 years ago, you know, or 13 years ago. It takes a little while, um, especially if you build public sector buildings and you have German fire regulations, which Bauhaus knew nothing about, believe me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that's really the, 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 tragic, uh, the tragic situation that we face in our buildings, it's okay, this room is, you know, 200 years old, and it's okay that 200 years ago they had a different idea of communication, but 13 years ago they are still building buildings that are effectively looking like this, just without the wall, you know, we have concrete walls, because that's modern, but not comfortable, um, not inducive to learning, not inducive to feeling at home, and I think that's, that's much more of the drama that I myself am, am facing, and, and I wonder where are you, Anna Ramos, uh, in the in the architects that build education buildings? You know. <laughs> so, so, so you think that? Um, I'm sorry. So, uh, so, uh, so you think that uh, this can be a, a wonderful inspiration for the complaints that you just say ventilated, right? And that this is really helpful, and of course, uh, it, it's I think crucial. Really, sure. Yeah, crucial to the education for sustainability. I think you need to have rooms that make you want to engage in these issues and not have, you know, a situation where there's a row of teachers at the front and a row of audience at the back and there's no discussion going on and there's no comfort. And you, how can you be creative sitting in a line like this or in these lines here? You know, we're not being creative. Before you go on, I give the words quickly back to the, the chair. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Doris Fischer, I'm Vice President of International Evaluation at University of Würzburg. Uh, we also have a Vice President for Sustainability, so she would probably be the better person to answer. Um, there are two things, I mean, different from uh, Hochschule Ruhr West, our university is pretty old. Um, not all the buildings are dated and <laughs> have such a long tradition, though, because most of Würzburg was destroyed after the Second World War. Uh, we have some wonderful, beautiful leftovers, though. Uh, and we have a new campus, uh, but the real challenge for us is uh, in Tuvok, we have a lot of buildings from the 60s, 70s or so. We also have a new campus that we kind of inherited from an American uh, barracks uh, area, which is which we are currently developing. But mostly the, the responsibility for buildings is not with the university or only partly. It's the buildings, many of the buildings are owned by the state and it's funded by the as a state of Bavaria, not the federal government. So there is always this question of, of what's going on. The good news is I'm currently sitting in a container because the building that I'm used to, usually sitting in is renovated for sustainability or for, yeah, for energy, um, how to say, preserving. And uh, so a lot of things are actually going on. The Bauhaus principles in general, I would say, are not, honestly, I have to say, not necessarily the guidance, but energy-related uh, questions, saving energy, and, and so is an issue. And we also try to develop new teaching buildings with, with uh, I mean, buildings that have a wonderful teaching environment. Whether at the end that is fulfilled uh, depends on the users and the future. Um, what I find most interesting from this challenge is actually that we are also trying to design the areas between the new buildings. Some of them are actually not new, but just renovated from these old barracks. And to define, uh, to develop places for the students together and to feel comfortable and somehow to, to sit together and have these kind of outside of the real teaching buildings, spaces where they can inter, uh, yeah, kind of uh, exchange and, and feel comfortable. Um, but again, that is always, I mean, I don't know, I, I mean, we also have to be realistic, there's always a challenge of money. I mean, that is, we are now also trying to create uh, ideas how to fund this uh, through our alumni and, and things like that. So there's just some remarks where reality bites, um, <laughs> uh, and um, I'm happy to go back to my container tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, I could answer many things by references, but uh, I let you drive the, no, just, just two little things because I don't want to focus everything on architecture, but the standards and facility managers are our common enemies, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we, we have enormous silos when we are designing our life spaces. And there's someone working on the fire department and there's someone working on the cleaning department and there's someone working on the energy saving department um, which don't talk to each other and don't have the goal of creating comfort spaces for human beings because it's very controversial. In, in this new European Bauhaus, there are two concepts which are controversial. One is Bauhaus itself, which uh, when, it's, when, when we... The Bauhaus uh, has, uh, uh, um, let's say, it's understood differently inside Germany and outside Germany. The Bauhaus owes everything to the diaspora of the professors and students that flew outside of Germany and created the whole tradition of the modern movement, architecture, design, arts, etc. In Germany, it's usually very much related to how complicated were the years of the Weimar Republic. So it. it uh, I was surprised in the anniversary, in the 100th centenary, in the year 19 of the creation, how controversial was it still sometimes uh, within Germany. Meanwhile, outside of Germany is well accepted, very well accepted. The other controversial word is beauty. But beauty exists. We cannot define it. It's different for each of us, but beauty exists. And beauty includes beautiful mathematics formulations or good you know, chemistry formulations. Everybody understands in its own field what is beautiful, what is well done, what is perfectly working. And uh, that's what we have to achieve. So it's not a matter of styles. It's not a matter of which materials. It's a matter of trying to achieve 
the perfect functionality, but functionality has to include physical and psychological comfort of uh, users. And uh, that's maybe the what I would like to add. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So maybe, um, uh, uh, sorry, ask, yes, yes, please. Yeah, oh. uh, I'm Jan Haren from Utrecht University. I'm involved in Charm. In Charm, we are working on a virtual campus. We try to work together in hybrid classrooms, but it is really difficult. And there need to be a very close relationship between the different departments who are responsible for building new buildings, new facilities, new arrangements for education, because there is a direct link between the way uh, classrooms are, are, are uh, designed and the pedagogy, the didactics. Uh, and uh, in our university in Utrecht, we are working on future learning spaces. We try, to, we try out all kinds of different ways, uh, uh, specifically from the point of view of new didactics. That's also what we are doing in Charm. And, we, and I think there is a chance if we work closely together with facilities and with, with, with builders and architects, that we can really build something new and that can be really helpful for the innovation of didactic concepts. Thank you. Yeah, I fully agree with, with your, I think we can build or we can create new new ways of building and new spaces for, for education. Also taking into account sustainability and, and inclusion, of course, and getting maybe neutrality or carbon neutrality in, in uh, 2030 or 50, but building the, the, build, the, the buildings, taking that into consideration. So this is um, an, an something we can learn from Charm because I was uh, uh, having a last uh, question for for Frank from uh, to come back to to the Charm. If there is no more questions in the in the ah yes there is another question. Sorry, I don't see you very well. Uh, sorry. Um, oh, that's very loud. Um, so for me, maybe the most interesting thing about the Bauhaus movement was less about its contribution to aesthetics and more about how it aims to democratize art and to make it accessible to a general audience. And I think maybe one of the reasons why we're lagging on the SDGs is that there isn't enough engagement from the general public around them. And I wonder maybe what the panel think about how alliances like Charm can reach a wider audience to spread these ideas. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, I don't know if any of you want to, to share some final words because we have uh, four minutes to finish. Well, I, thank you for the question. I think, uh, although I am a mathematician, I, I know how people from film and media uh, think about uh, the, the importance that our alliance uh, has in, in, in the topic of spreading uh, the message about any, any subject. We live in a golden era for the audiovisual uh, media and uh, all of us know that uh, these media have uh, lots of power among people. So the message of the new European Bauhaus or whatever we can uh, use uh, many, many audiovisual uh, instruments to try to pass the message to people. We can use uh, podcasts, we can use interviews, documentaries, films, series. You can use uh, many things in order to promote the, the, the ideas you want to, to convey. In, in Film EU, besides the, the, the education part, in the, the research part that we have inside our alliance. We also have the, the, the public engagement with the society and we try to, to, to educate also uh, external stakeholders uh, about the importance 
of the media in our in our culture. So I think uh, I think uh, Filmi U can can uh, give uh, a very good contribution to spread the message of the new European Bauhaus principles. And in particular, I think the, the aesthetics principle is the one that is more related, in fact, with film. Because uh, film is about creativity and imagination. And creativity and imagination activities, obviously, in, in the mindset of, of, of people that are working on these areas, leads to beauty. So I think, I think this is very important in this area, and I think Film EU will will give a, a very good contribution to these to these values in Europe and beyond. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, and I agree. <laughs> um, I think uh, coming out of COP last month, uh, those, the parties have recognized the importance of pursuing an approach to education that promotes a shift in lifestyles with whilst fostering patterns of development and sustainability sustainability based on care, community and cooperation. That was the decision uh, last month. And really what I think is, is important in that conversation is we know there's a need for new and innovative solutions, specifically for global challenges. Uh, my, my part of that is the climate change challenge and all of that. And we know that there's a need for a lot of experimentation, learning and relearning. And I think there's a, there's a massive role for, for European universities to play within that conversation. Um, there's already um, great examples uh, in the room from Charmy, you and others, to the enabling environments to promote collaboration within EU countries. Um, I encourage you to think globally as well, um, bringing in stakeholders. Um, we at the UN are uh, happy to, to collaborate as much as possible. And, and the reason I'm here is because we have a, a university partnership program. Um, but I think there's, there's, a, there's a real opportunity now to develop this environment, this, this transformative environment that, that's coming through some of these alliances and charming you to facilitate knowledge exchange to address some of these, these really big challenges. Um, and I encourage you to think, you know, ha not just in the north to south collaborations, but south to north and south south and how these can be um, brought in, you know, benchmarking, um, you know, opportunities within the, within the initiative. I could go on, but I know we're short on time, so I'll stop that. Thanks. Thank you. Is it? Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I know we are run out of time, but I cannot resist the temptation of saying something. I'm a member of CharmU and I'm professor of drawing at the Faculty of Fine Arts here at the University of Barcelona. And uh, there's no, nothing in any of the SDGs about the benefits of art. And uh, it's a forgotten agent, you know, the SDG uh, Sustainable Goals and the Agenda 2030. I'm so sorry, but uh, yeah, is uh, the aesthetic thinking is around the creativity. There's something about heritage and tangible heritage, infrastructures, uh, the benefit of not using yeah, chemistry in fil filming or any art practice, if you want. But there's nothing about how the art ideology working in cooperation and all the values that are and have included in their practice, especially in contemporary art. And there's nothing mentioned about it, neither in the 176 indexes neither nothing about it so i cannot i cannot um i, th I think something has to change uh, from here to the 20 and 30 accomplishment of the agenda 2030 to include this as one of the major values because um we can see many art practices that they include alliances education prosperity, poverty, gender, the all 17 ones. And uh, it's a shame, but uh, I cannot resist to <laughs> come here with me, the, my, my double-headed um, head. Thank you. Yeah, now 
Thank you, Viviana. Now I think it's time to, to close the session. Um, thank you very much to all of you for being here in this diverse and transdisciplinary conversation. And thank you all the audience for your contributions. And let's... Uh, audience now it's okay so thank you very much uh, for all, all these two great days well first of all thanks to our delegate on sustainability for making possible the impossible of wrapping two sessions in the time that she had which was less than expected um thank you all for coming it has been a great pleasure for us at the university of barcelona hosting this event i know that there are still some uh, final elements of the program uh, side events and so on that will continue uh, all through this evening but the big gathering uh, concludes uh, in a way now. So thank you really honestly for your contributions. I think that we have made clear that peer learning and cross-sectional alliances are the fundamental element in order to address all the challenges that we have in front of us. So from that perspective, uh, our honest uh, congratulations and thank you uh, in the name of the University of Barcelona and also in the name of CHARM uh, EU. As two final uh, logistical comments, as you know, uh, now you have the network launching partnership with Unidiversity. Those of you who may want to join it, it's on the hall of the university, so right down the stairs with the big Christmas tree. And also regarding the uh, room, we will close it up until uh, 10 past two, so you can leave your stuff here, but be aware that if you need to bring it because you have to catch a plane or whatever, before past uh, 10 past two, it will be closed. So if that's the case, it might be better that you bring it uh, with you now. Uh, and finally, as a also final note, at uh, past half past three, sorry, we will have the kickoff meeting of the Charm EU, uh, Charm 8 Alliance. So in that case, those of the, you belonging to the Charm uh, 8 Alliance, you are also welcome to join us uh, here at the Aula Magna at half past uh, three. I think I'm not missing anything. Well, I do. I'm I'm do miss something, which is uh, thanking also to those who have made uh, uh, possible the event in terms of uh, logistics, in terms of audiovisual covering. Of course, the text to speech uh, possibility that has made uh, available the inclusive approach also to the conference. So, without further hesitation, lunch is prepared for you. And thank you very much once again. to the second day on how the European Universities Initiative can support the European Green Deal. It's my pleasure to present the first annual open forum of the TORCH project. The opening of this brand new academic year and the opening ceremony.